morning, everyone. Thanks for being here and appreciate your patience. Um, it's always nice to have visitors. We got a pretty exciting program this morning, and uh, more about that in just a moment. The time is now 9:45, and a quorum of the board's present. The State Board of Education meeting of February 11th is hereby called to order. The first item is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Do I have a motion? Please? So moved. Support. Moved by Lupe. Support by Cassandra. Any additions, deletions, comments? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. And before I introduce Mertz, who's going to introduce us, what's this about Caleb and new grandkid or something here that I hear? Oh, yes. I'm adding to my grandkid collection. I didn't know you were going to say that. But <laughs> Sunday, Caleb Philip Schneider was born to our son. Hey. I'm getting another one in April, so you might have to hear about that, too. <laughs> Everyone is great, so thanks. Thank you. Um, what's the count? Um, five in one family, and the third in another family is on the way, so eight. Last right. year I had two grandchildren. Now I'm going to have eight. So times Merry change. Christmas. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and she's still always smiling. That's the thing we love about Mercy. That's the best part. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, please. Okay. Please, thank you. So, thanks, Mike. Uh, to my left, as you all know, is Mike Flanagan. He is the chairman of the board. He's the state superintendent. To his left, the president of the board, John Austin. John resides in Ann Arbor. Next to him, the board's vice president, Cassandra Albrich from Rochester Hills. Dan Varner is on his way. He's from Detroit. He's the board's secretary. And then moving around the table, Lupe Ramos-Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. This year's Michigan Teacher of the Year is Gary Abood Jr. He's from North High School in the Grosse Point Public School Systems where he teaches physics and chemistry. Across the table, Craig Ruff. He's the Governor's Education Advisor. Eileen Weiser, board member from Ann Arbor. Kathleen Strauss, board member from Detroit. Michelle Fecto board member from Detroit. She is also the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. Next to me is Richard Ziley. He's from Dearborn. He's the board's treasurer. Thank you. Thanks, Mertz. A um, couple of things. First of all, congratulations to board member Richard Ziley. We really appreciate your taking on the work for NASB as the chair of the rural study group. And I know you've You've committed time to visit rural districts in the state, understand their issues, and uh, it's a big win for Michigan to have you in that leadership role, so thank you. Um, John, I thought, did a great job with the Ed Alliance yesterday on laying the groundwork for the finance work here in the department. Um, and I could tell it was received really well, so that's a, a great beginning of that. Um, I want to fess up. Some of you already heard this on WJR this morning. Uh, yes, I have thrown my hat in the ring to become the Pistons coach. Um, and uh, Paul W. kept going with it. And it was to try to keep him on his heels because I didn't want him asking too many tough questions, uh, although he has a way. I, I was appreciative of the fact that he repeated the fact that uh, I thought I was pulling the right cord when I said, well, Doug Rothwell and the business leaders are for the smarter balance. And then he said, well, if Doug Rothwell's for smarter balance, it's got to be the right thing. So maybe that'll help us get over the line. I, I know the board has done a lot of work as well as uh, Wendy and our team here to, uh, to make that a reality. I'd like to recognize Representative Tom Cochran, who's in the audience, sir. If you'd wait, thank you for being here. I, and I know he's here actually for the Chavez resolution and didn't realize it wasn't until this afternoon when they're in, in session. So I wanted to at least recognize him for making the time and being here to join us today. So thank you very much. Former fire chief here in Lansing at one time. So, and now you're, now you're allowed to grow this, right? You're probably... I'm asking you I thought we'd just show, Marty was thinking we'd show one little thing here because it's the truth. Tim Skubik said that I'm incompetent, and we might as well get it on the table and be done with it here. As long as you've been soup, you've talked about extending the school year behind, behind or ahead 180. You've failed miserably. How come? 
I'm not a voting legislator. Uh, you know, yeah, but I, your job is to get folks in the legislature. We've gotten some. I mean, we've, we've got the some. Michigan, we've gotten the Michigan Merit Curriculum through, which was a big deal. Yeah, and but that I'm talking about that, extending the school year. I think they're just not willing to take it on. I mean, yeah, because, you're right. Because of pushback back home. Exactly. I mean, this is where I think the hypocrisy is. It, it's with no malice, but even parents, oh my gosh, Korea is doing better than we are in Finland. We're not in school. I mean, when you add Korea, not only having more days, but their whole, it, this isn't about their system. This is the culture of tutoring at night, by the way. There's whole other things that go on in other countries, and we're not even willing to put the days in. So you're right. I've failed miserably in terms of getting them to go more days a year, but uh, it is what it is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I'm doing right now, which is keep pitching it. Okay. Failed miserably. I'm moving on. But, uh, <laughs> but I would hope, uh, and especially with the representative here, I do think it, it, it really puts our teachers at a disadvantage. There's a lot of, uh, my daughter's a teacher, as many of you know, a uh, public school teacher here in Michigan, and it's demoralizing when we get compared internationally and there's kind of a general criticism. I tried to handle a little bit of that on JR this morning. Uh, it comes up all the time. But, you know, if Finland's doing 220 days and Korea's doing 200 days and they're also tutoring at night, the nature of the culture for South Korean parents, um, it's hard for our teachers to, to work in that environment. It takes, it takes time. So, anyway, but I might as well get on the table. Since I'm a miserable failure, I'm going for that Pistons job. That's where I was connecting <laughs> the dots here. <laughs> She's such a nice guy. And then two things I really want to do, I, I was going to wait till later, but I know the audience uh, collapses a little bit at that time. And I, I thought if I don't recognize uh, Carol Eastlick, who's retiring at the end of the month, would you stand up, Carol? She has been a jewel for this department in ways that people just couldn't imagine. So thanks, Carol, for your service. 28 years, literally the go-to person in the department. And then, you know, I'm disappointed on this next one, uh, but I get it. Um, we have a young rising star in the department uh, who was lured away, you know, uh, educational testing service. It's a problem in our second floor that um, testing is such a big thing federally that uh, they pay very well. They look for the best talent they can get. So it really is a compliment to the department to have one stolen from us who, as I said, is not only an existing leader who put together that assessment report that the legislature required by December 1, but did, did, does such a grand job for us and we'll miss him. But Vince Dean, I want you to be able to stand up and thanks for your service too. And we have a bunch of openings down there for that reason. It's hard to fill these, but, uh, but I, think, I think actually when we get over this, and I hope we do get over this smarter balance issue and have that appropriate it and, and move on. It'll give some stability so that our folks will uh, uh, be encouraged to, to be here for the long run. So, um, but I'm not surprised you were recruited. And as I said, it's a source of pride, not only for you and your family, but for us that they thought so highly of you. Thanks. Okay. Um, this is our first item today. And I guess extending personal privileges for a second, I, I, Mike and Phil are two people that I've known for many years. John was good enough to start out with what I think are the two best thinkers on these issues of school finance in the state and in some cases in the nation. But I do want to bring out, you know, when it comes to, to, to Mike and I, we had this old Boston College Notre Dame rivalry for years, and we haven't really been on each other's back too much recently. But the irony is U of M professor Phil Kearney is a big Notre Dame fan. I don't know how you exist in that environment. Does it? Yeah. Well, I wore that the tie for you today just to have that. And I, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, and John, I then sincerely, even after he left that alliance yesterday, I said, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but John's basically a policy wonk in the best sense and very thoughtful about these issues. and is genuine in his attempt to move the ball on this this year. Um, and, and I thought appropriately took the politics out of this by saying the report done after the, after the election and yet have the discussion now so people can start to be thinking about this. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, I'm a little disappointed and said on this show with, uh, I, I'm not sure why we would be giving tax relief at a time when the schools need the money so much. 
So I hope we could stand up to that, but it seems like it's got legs of its own, and that would just be a small dose. But I also appreciated how John pointed out this isn't just about money for money's sake. <clears throat> he said it here and he said it again yesterday. It's to have our outcomes be better, you know, so that we actually can attribute resources to better outcomes and to be thoughtful about how that is. And I thought your remark about early college in particular was really well placed because every child in this state should have an opportunity for an early college opportunity where free, in effect, community college after a five-year program and appreciate your advocacy for that. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to John to kind of make the formal introductions here of our guests. I don't know if there's anything more I need to say. I covered, uh, I appreciate your comments. Um, and Mike's alluding to I went to the Ed Alliance yesterday to basically invite them into this public discussion that we want to have about uh, what are the issues, what are the um, major uh, challenges we face, and what do we do about it in terms of the way we organize and plan and put resources behind education to get the outcomes we want. And, Appreciate your comments too on, on the radio. You didn't say Paul W. Smith was, it was very good. I thought that you pointed out the, um, if business leaders from Michigan and the teachers unions, the MEA, are for something like the Common Core or the assessment, it's got to be a good thing. He was a little less familiar with the teachers union that you were talking about. And we don't work with them very much, but he was, he took heart that business leaders from Michigan were for it. So that was uh, uh, a good way to frame the argument. But. As uh, Mike indicated, I'm delighted uh, to have um, Mike and Phil, and I'll introduce them a little more formally here in a second, to start this process. We did agree last month that we as a board certainly want to spend the next nine months um, paying attention to what the major issues are in the way we organize, finance, and support education uh, that as we're seeing the stress put on our schools and effects on outcomes. We want to understand uh, what those are from a uh, thoughtful perspective so that we can do better uh, in the way we organize and run the education railroad here in Michigan and looking for uh, the ideas for the major directions of improvement and change uh, and so we can make our best recommendations to the governor and legislature but also as a, uh, as a, as a team effort here in Michigan uh, better understand where we need to go and how we need to get there to improve educational outcomes. So I'm delighted that uh, at this first meeting we have to get Anisio and Phil Kearney um, Mike is a professor of education policy at the College of Education at Wayne State University, he teaches school finance. He's been assistant state superintendent for research and policy at the department uh, and was Governor John English education policy advisor. Um, Phil Kearney is professor emeritus at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. He's been in uh, many roles there, associate dean of the school. He also served as associate director of the national and deputy <coughs> director for the Institute for Educational Leadership in Washington, D.C. And Phil and uh, Mike, they co-authored a book a few years ago, uh, Education Reform and the Limits of Policy, which I don't know if we want to talk about the limits of policy, <laughs> but uh, they are, as Mike said, probably among the nation and our state's most thoughtful um, analysts and workers in the education arena. So thank you for joining us and sharing your perspective on And we, we offered, uh, come on up, Mike and Phil, we offered uh, these folks and others that we're going to hear from the pretty open-ended uh, uh, charge that was in our resolution that we passed. What are the major issues and trends uh, that are uh, affecting our education outcomes performance related to the way we're organizing and financing schools? What, if anything, can we learn from other states and other uh, ways of organizing education? And what will be some recommendations from your perspective about uh, major directions for change and improvement so we get better outcomes, as Mike said. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, John. <clears throat> and uh, good morning. Um, this morning, uh, what we would like to do is split our time into two large pieces. Uh, first, about 30 minutes presenting our ideas and accompanying information and data. And second, maybe another 30 minutes for follow-up and discussion with you about what we've had to say. Uh, we'll also split that first part, this first part, into two smaller pieces. I'm going to take about 10 minutes to offer some thoughts about an organizing framework that we think might be helpful to you. And Mike will use the <coughs> remaining 20 minutes to offer some specific information and some ideas about needed reforms in Michigan education. Uh, first, let me talk about the organizing framework. As we thought about the issues that the state board 
faces as it moves forward in its examination of school finance and organization in Michigan, we thought it might be useful for you to spend a few minutes sharing with you a framework. A framework or, if you will, an analytic scheme that we have found useful in our own past efforts at looking at uh, reform in Michigan education. And the framework is based on four predominant policy values that have long undergirded American education and certainly Michigan education. We think that consideration of these four policy values might serve you well as you set out to do what you have to do. The four policy values are equity, adequacy, efficiency, and choice. And let me say a brief word about each. Uh, the first of the four values, equity, is not necessarily equality, although sometimes it calls for that. Equity is concerned with fairness and justice, justice and fairness. It raises the question of whether the current finance system is just and fair to the citizens' taxpayers who have the responsibility of providing the resources necessary to offer quality education programs in our public schools. It also raises the question of whether the system is just and fair in its allocation of those resources among the more than 500 school districts, the more than 3,000 public schools, and the more than one and a half million public school students in the state of Michigan. And perhaps equally important, it also raises the question of how just and fair the system is in actually delivering a quality education program to each and every child and young person who goes through our public school system. The second policy value in this framework, adequacy, is a two-sided coin. The first side deals with the availability of resources. It asks whether the revenue streams currently in place, principally state and local, are providing the funds needed to deliver a quality education to each and every child and young person in each and every public school and public school district. It also asks whether these revenue streams are strong and stable enough to provide these funds in both good and bad economic times. In short, adequacy concerns itself with the volume and the stability of the revenue stream, as well as with the sufficiency of those revenues to the task of delivering a sound basic education to every public school student. The third value, efficiency, or accountability, if you will, is a value that's near and dear to the hearts of most Americans and certainly to most Michiganders. It asks whether the schools are making good use of the resources being provided them. Whether we as citizens and taxpayers are getting the best bang for the buck. Whether money is making a difference. Whether the schools are being held accountable for student performance. In Michigan, I think as you well know, we spent a good deal of time and effort on these concerns witnessed the over 40-year effort to build a state assessment program, and for that matter, a national assessment program, <clears throat> aimed at assessing the academic achievement levels of students in our public schools, and then publicly reporting those results to the citizenry, and witnessed the more than 10-year effort to establish a state accountability program. First, education, yes. Then, Michigan's state accreditation system, MISAS. Then, Michigan's state accreditation and accountability system, MISAS, if, if it comes to pass. <laughs> and currently, and most recently, of course, we've seen much attention being given to the question of educator effectiveness. Choice, the last of the four values in the framework, also has two dimensions. The first dimension, and the one that usually comes to our mind, is choice of school 
for both students and parents. Parental voice and parental choice, as well as student voice and student choice, have become, if you will, a cause celeb uh, in this nation over the course of the past 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, beginning, or certainly here in Michigan, policymakers have been pay paying increasing attention to parents and students' power or right to choose the type and setting of the schooling that will be provided to their daughters and sons, I should say, to parents and other citizens. Uh, as you well know, in this state, this increasing attention led to the legislature's 1993 establishment of the and the rapid growth of charter schools or public school academies. The Michigan legislature in 1996 further enhanced parental and student choice in its adoption of the Schools of Choice program. And here we might ask, what needs to be done to ensure Michigan's charter school movement does indeed evolve into a meaningful and important school reform? And what needs to be done to address the sometimes negative effects of the Schools of Choice program? For example, further segregation of students by race and socioeconomic status. The second dimension of choice as it's applied to public education usually goes by the name of local control. The extent to which educational decisions should be left at the local school community or district level are centralized at the state level or for that matter at the federal level. It would seem that there's no question but that recent years have seen an upward and a centralizing movement, a centralizing movement of authority and decision making in American public education. However, in Detroit, we saw this movement uh, play out in something of a ping pong fashion. First, we had the decentralization effort of the 1970s, then the recentralization of the 1980s, followed by the state takeover of the late 1990s and 2000s, and then a return, return to an elected board in 2005, followed not long after by the appointment of an emergency financial manager in 2009. And then a rising call beginning in 2010 for mayoral control of the schools. But back to our main argument. We're suggesting that these four policy values might serve you well as an organizing framework as you move, move forward in your investigation. However, a, a word of caution probably is in order here. While one might attempt to proceed in orderly fashion in basing one's reflections on these policy values, it's difficult to treat them in sequential, sequential order. This is because these values not only are closely interrelated, but they actually compete with one another. Uh, and as we have noted elsewhere, and, and I would quote from our 2002 primer on Michigan school finance, the underlying values, demands, and interests that drive public policy decisions are often mutually incompatible. In short, they compete with one another. These values, demands, and interests, all vitally important to us as American citizens, include equity, adequacy, efficiency, and choice. But when taken together, they all cannot be given equal weight. An answer to one will influence the answer to another. But that is inherent in the nature of the public policy process in our nation and state. And coming to an acceptable balance among these competing values, demands, and interests is the continuing task of the citizens of the state, you and your elected representatives. Let me now turn the chair over to Michael to share with you some specific information and some ideas we have about needed reforms in Michigan education. Okay, well, I want to thank um, 
the board and uh, and Mike for the uh, invitation to uh, start a discussion that I, I think the time is is right for this. Uh, we may be at a at a point where um, we can ask whether or not our schools are, are adequately resourced. We can take a look at the outcomes that we've seen in our public schools uh, in, in recent years and begin a debate. And there are, you know, as, as, as Phil suggested, there are competing values and no easy answers here. Um, I put together a, a few slides to summarize some analysis of uh, educational outcomes and talk a little bit about resource levels. And uh, I'd like to start with, um, to the extent we, we can compare how Michigan is doing with other states, the, the, uh, the, the data source that uh, I like to use here, I take my cues from um, assessment experts, is the, the so-called nation's report card, National Assessment of Educational Progress. I think it um, gives you a pretty good basis to see how Michigan is doing in comparison uh, with some other states. Uh, ass assessment experts uh, point to this uh, assessment as being a high quality instrument uh, uh, partic with particular emphasis on uh, the uh, measurement of math skills. Um, it's not a high stakes test, so it's not subject to the criticism that uh, there's a lot of teaching to the test. And uh, it's, it's a general uh, indicator of performance. Um, I've, I've, I've got a, uh, a few slides here uh, that uh, rank the states according to some measures of improvement over the years on um, reading and math tests. And th this first slide, I apologize, it's, it's, it doesn't show up all that well on the screen. Uh, this is a ranking of the states by a composite of the scale scores of the states uh, for grades four and eight reading and math and the uh, measurement encompasses all students. Um, and it shows the, the gains in the scale scores achieved by the states between 2003 and 2011. And you, you've probably seen, if not this presentation, similar presentations. And Michigan is, is well down uh, in the ratings. We happen to be 47th out of uh, uh, 50 states in the District of Columbia here. Uh, there are many causes for these uh, lack of gains. This is not to say that this is uh, the school's doing or the teacher's doing. I mean, later on we're going to touch on what has happened to income levels in the, in the economy in, in this uh, state. But I think that uh, it, it does give us an idea as to the challenges we have in front of us in terms of educational outcomes for uh, children in our schools. Uh, and another state that I like to point out in these rankings, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard much discussion of the performance of the public schools in Massachusetts. Now, sometimes I think it's useful to take a look at a state where um, the outcomes appear to be strong, um, policy decisions, financing decisions, organizational decisions seem to have uh, paid off. So we'll, we'll kind of keep Massachusetts in mind a little bit as a, a model that, we, that you all might want to look to as, as this um, project uh, moves down the road. By the way, we still hear a little bit of that Massachusetts accent in you, so. Yeah, you know, Mike, yeah, I've, been, I've been in Michigan a long time, and I still haven't toned it out. If, if you listen to my wife Joan speak, I mean, it sounds like she, she, she just came out of Boston last week. <laughs> Um, here is the, the same ranking of the states according to a uh, composite measure of uh, gain scores. This measure encompasses only the children from low-income families, free and reduced-price lunch children. Uh, here, Michigan is 31st. Uh, Massachusetts is third. Um, when you think about why is it that Massachusetts is doing so well, it's probably a, 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 a very complex set of answers. A um, couple of things to look at is that um, way back in 1993, Massachusetts did, uh, the legislature passed a, uh, a piece of legislation called the uh, Education Reform Act. Uh, it set ambitious academic goals for their public schools. 
it introduced a high stakes test for high school graduation. And uh, it did provide uh, substantially more money for the public schools. And the lion's share of that additional money was targeted to the urban schools. And you know, we we're all aware of the debate about the relationship between resources and outcomes. But I would submit that we have, uh, in um, recent decades, learned lessons as to the best use of resources. I think educators know what to do with resources now. And uh, I think it has paid off in Massachusetts. Uh, the third slide that I, this will be the, the last uh, uh, slide addressing outcomes. This is a ranking of the states according to the difference between a state's actual performance on these uh, composite scale score gains and their predicted performance in light of the proportion of children who attend schools in each state who are low income. So it's sort of an, an actual versus predicted measure for each state. And here, once again, um, Michigan ranks 47th. Massachusetts uh, ranks second. Um, with regard to resources, uh, we've, we've uh, seen quite a bit of discussion about this topic uh, in, in the press recently. So I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this. But um, here we have a uh, Can look. Just give us the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I sometimes get that question, you know, is, is, what is the right per pupil amount? Is, is there a correct amount? I say theoretically you could calculate one for each school given the, the children who are in the school and some measure of their needs. But for now I think we'll, we'll just take a look at, uh, this is uh, total appropriations for K-12 education. These, these are uh, not in constant dollars. And what you can see is that it's, it's hovered around uh, sort of a billion dollars a grade level, but it, it hasn't uh, shown much growth over the years, and you can see the uh, different sources of this revenue, the school aid fund, the general fund. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting when you look at uh, the history of uh, financing our public schools in Michigan that the, uh, the general fund contribution to the schools has really uh, dwindled over the years. There, there are some good reasons for that, and, and um, some perhaps uh, a little more political, but uh, back in the uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, annually we would see appropriations of uh, 500 to 600 million dollars from the general fund into the school aid fund each year. Uh, that has uh, pretty much dried up, in part because of growth in the uh, in the school aid fund. Uh, when we look at per pupil revenues, uh, this next slide gives us a look at um, this level of funding adjusted for the consumer price index. And the, the green portions of these columns uh, look at the revenues that are available to the public schools after the uh, cost of retirement uh, has been paid. And we can see that uh, in real terms, the non-retirement uh, per pupil revenue uh, for our public schools was lower in fiscal 2012 than in uh, fiscal 2004. Uh, this graphic addresses uh, all public schools. Now, when we look, when you, when you think about the uh, Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System, uh, this is a system that serves our teachers in our so-called traditional public schools. Uh, it also serves a, uh, our teachers in about, I think, between 40 and 50 of our public school academies, because if, if a public school academy is authorized by a local board of education or an ISD board, then they would be uh, covered by this, this system. And here again, in real terms, we, you can look at per pupil revenues to the districts uh, falling uh, over the period from uh, fiscal 2004 to 2012. So we're, it, it's, it's pretty clear that real per pupil funding for our children uh, has declined uh, over the years. It's also true that if you just, because if you just focus on the per pupil funding, you lose another dimension of the resources available to the schools. And that comes into play when you look at uh, our memberships statewide. And it is true that for the vast majority of our traditional school districts, they have been losing enrollments. And you know, I don't have to tell you what a um, 
challenge that creates for the, the, the leaders and the teachers and the schools to deal with uh, not only declining per pupil resources, but declining total resources. And you know, I've, I've been teaching at Wayne State now for going on 20 years, and a lot of my students are uh, public school teachers or school business managers, and I sort of on a, an anecdotal but abundant basis, I hear uh, a lot about the, the, the struggles that uh, they endure to try to do, as, as most anybody in the public sector is doing these days, trying to do more with less. Um, here is just a, a little, uh, sort of another look at the pressures on school districts to fund the retirement system. And here I've, I've plotted out the percentage of payroll uh, dollar amount that uh, school districts are instructed by Lansing each year to contribute into the retiree trust fund. And uh, you can see how that percentage has grown in recent years. Um, you know, it, it is true now that the, the appropriations process has changed a bit, and I think if my numbers are right, uh, in recent years the, uh, the legislature and, and the governor's office has appropriated, uh, I think, over a half a billion dollars directly into the teacher retirement fund. And it is true that if that appropriation had not occurred, then the liability would have fallen to the school districts. To, to meet those uh, actuarial obligations. So I think we all recognize that uh, funding the retirement system is a, is a challenge in creating a burden for the, uh, for the public schools. Um, when we think about the challenge of uh, funding our public schools in the state, I think we, we have to keep in mind a little bit of uh, our economic history in this state. And I, I um, found this, I find very informative graphic uh, on the website uh, put together by the House Fiscal Agency, just showing how uh, Michigan has changed uh, over the decades from a relatively prosperous state to a relatively low income state. And what the what this time series plots out is uh, Michigan per capita income as compared with the national average. And you can see that since uh, really the um, middle 1990s, we have been uh, below the national average. And I, I think that this phenomenon <coughs> manifests itself in a number of ways. Uh, it, I think it uh, manifests itself in that we see more uh, needy children in our public schools. We see uh, more pressures on the public treasury, uh, more competition for scarce public dollars. Uh, I think in, in a couple of slides that uh, are coming up, I, I think we're going to see evidence that I sort of interpret as um, a reluctance to fund public programs the way citizens in Michigan did some years ago. And I think this all uh, is brought to bear on our public schools and other public sector programs in the state. So kind of keeping in mind the um, economic challenges that citizens in the state have been in, enduring in recent years, um, I went back and, and um, took a look at total personal income in the state of Michigan, and then using uh, state government sources uh, totaled up the uh, state and local revenue that we allocate to our uh, public schools. And you can see, you can see here the, uh, the, the plotting. Uh, if you go back to about 2004-2005, uh, Almost 4.1% of total income in Michigan was allocated to our K-12 public schools. And by the year 2011-2012, we were down to a little better than 3.4%. Uh, I'm going to translate this in a minute into dollars. But I, I just wanted to make the point here that, um, and you know this, uh, you know, budgets are choices. And we've, we've got to take a look at, as a society, as a state, what kind of choices are we making with respect to the support of the children in our public schools. Um, I think when you, when you look at a presentation like this, um, I think you, you have to realize that 
the change you see over time is at least in part due to um, policy decisions. I mean, I would submit, you can interpret these in different ways, but I would submit that the state of Michigan has made what, you, what I would call a, something of a disinvestment in public schools in recent years. Um, now, how might we translate a uh, set of data like that? Well, one way to do it is to just say, if we were to sort of match uh, today the effort that we made on behalf of our public school children uh, back in 2005, these would be the changes we would have to make. And the, these are uh, my estimates. Uh, and as you can see, the numbers are fairly substantial. Uh, and they actually, just last night I was doing, kind of going through the file of, of um, recent analyses that other folks have done on Michigan public school finance, and I came across some work by a, a good friend and colleague, Dave Arson at Michigan State, and I, I happened to see that he came out with a similar statistic. Um, he, he compared two different points in time, uh, 2002 versus 2011, but uh, his, his per pupil estimates were pretty much right on um, where, I've, where I've come out for the year 2011-2012. So when you think about increasing uh, per pupil funding in the state by $1,500, that's uh, obviously a substantial amount. Um, an another uh, way to look at sort of the changing attitudes toward the public sector in the state, I think, is um, to take a look at how, to, to what extent total tax collections in Michigan compare with total income in Michigan. And what I have here for you is a graphic that was prepared by uh, the Michigan Office of the State Budget. And this, this picture addresses one piece of the so-called Headley Amendment uh, passed years ago. One part of the amendment uh, says that the state of Michigan shall not collect more than 9.5% of our total income in taxes. The precise figure is 9.49. I remember it because I remember when it was introduced. And this graphic kind of shows over the years how close uh, revenue collections by the state have come to that limit. And you can see that uh, at the time the uh, Headley Amendment was adopted by the voters of Michigan, the state of Michigan was fairly close to collecting its maximum allowable limit of income in the form of taxes. And you can see then the results of some economic cycles where the, the gap opened up a bit. And then by the um, middle 90s, the state of Michigan was once again very, very close to that 9.5% limit uh, on tax collections. And then you can see what has happened since about the year 2000. Even taking us through the Great Recession of 2008, uh, tax collections in Michigan as a percentage of uh, total personal income has fallen substantially to the, to the point where um, in 2008, 2009, the state of Michigan had about $8 billion of room underneath this Headley constraint. And, and I just offer that to, to make the point that we, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is a, this is a very opportune time to talk about the, uh, the resource needs of our schools. And if, if uh, the political will is there, I think there's some evidence that the resources are there. Um, there are some constitutional limits on taxation that we have to keep in mind as, as, as you all move forward on this project. Um, one uh, limit has to do with uh, property taxes that are uh, available to support schools. And as a part of the Proposal A reforms of 1994, uh, this Section 3 was added to our Finance and Taxation Article of the Constitution. Um, indicating that uh, any increase in the property tax rate that will raise money for schools would have to be approved by three quarters of the members of both the House and the Senate. A very strong supermajority requirement here. Uh, Section 7 is that that did not come in with Proposal A. That, to my knowledge, has been in the Michigan Constitution uh, for a long time, well before Proposal A, and that has to do with um, prohibition on having a graduated state income tax. But I mentioned that, that first section on the property tax because um, 
and I, this is just a, a, a recommendation, an idea, maybe a, a starting point for some discussion down the road. But um, I, I have heard of a little bit more discussion in the last few years about Michigan reintroducing the local school district enhancement millage. You know, and I, and I, I fully get it about the, the political difficulty in getting something like that done. It kind of re reminds me of your observations about extending the school year. It's not easy. But this could be a possibility. Um, and I say that because when Proposal A became uh, the law of the land in 1994, it did allow for a local school district enhancement millage. The millage was limited to no more than three years and no more than three mills. But in here you'd have to get an attorney to make the argument here, but it is a possibility, I think, that this was a millage that was in place on that date mentioned in the Constitution. So there might be, without a constitutional amendment, an opportunity statutorily, if there is a will, to introduce something like this. And uh, this could be done in a number of different ways. Uh, the state would have to be uh, mindful of the possibility that wealthy school districts could could reinstate the millage and then sort of move ahead of everyone else. Uh, there are ways technically to design an enhancement millage that would mitigate a, uh, an issue like that. Uh, it could be a millage that would be equalized by the state. So again, that a, a property poor community voting such a millage would be able, would be eligible for matching funds from the state because they would otherwise realize just a low yield on a millage locally. But just, just as an idea of um, a way to give voters, you know, it's, it's their, their children, their taxes, let them decide if they want to supplement the, uh, the state foundation allowance. Um, another recommendation that uh, might be worthy of discussion, uh, and you've heard this one uh, before at the board table and in other venues, uh, that we might want to have some state participation in the financing of major capital projects in the school districts. If you need to build a new school or, or remodel or fix a school, uh, right now there is no grant support available from the state. The great majority of states provide such assistance to their local school districts. And um, we have had survey studies in the state that have confirmed that uh, there are capital needs uh, to be uh, found across our local school districts. Um, a, a, a third recommendation that I, I'm, I'll, I'll just put forward for consideration has to do with uh, investment in early education. And here I think that I think we're making great strides. Uh, first, what, I've, what I have here is a graphic that summarizes some work done by um, Professor James Heckman, uh, uh, Nobel laureate in economics from the University of Chicago. And if you follow early childhood education, you probably have come across his work. Uh, this, this graphic is really sort of a, a summary or amalgamation of, of extensive research that he has done. And his message is that when you invest in people, best to invest when they're young. That will, it'll, it'll do the best for them and, and for all of us. Uh, and he's, he, he particularly uh, underscores the importance of um, preschool and for uh, help for infants and support programs for infants and toddlers. So here um, kind of leads into a, a recommendation where uh, great strides have been made already. Uh, we, we have this year um, <coughs> An increase of $65 million in the funding for um, early education for low-income four-year-old children. And, you know, um, kudos to um, the, the, the governor's office and, and to the business community that I think became persuaded by research, so particularly the benefit-cost analyses of these kinds of investments. It's, uh, you, it, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better investment of public resources. And I think that um, Another substantial increase is called for in the coming year, and I would uh, say that uh, if, if we could, this program could be uh, very profitably expanded to three-year-old children and kind of align it with that great Perry Preschool program that was offered on an experimental basis years ago uh, in Ypsilanti. 
Uh, and then finally, um, uh, a fourth recommendation here uh, is, this is an, an, an education recommendation, but I think that uh, it, it speaks to uh, what we know to be true in terms of the, the influence of a child's life outside of school on the child's performance and ability to learn in school. And uh, we may now have the, re the resources to consider restoring uh, Michigan's portion of the earned income tax credit. Uh, during 2013, nearly 800,000 low-income working families felt the impact of the reduction in this program that was, that was recently put in place. Um, we've got to recognize that uh, for school-age children, most of their great majority of their waking hours are spent outside of school. So the quality of their life at home and in their neighborhoods is very, very important to their um, success in school. So, uh, and, and I, I think also it's important for educators to, uh, to recognize what we know, and that is the importance of the child's economic well-being as a fundamental building block for their success at school. So I just, I just offer these uh, recommendations as, as uh, possibilities to consider. And again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about this. And I, I think you, you, the, the timing of this is, is uh, excellent. Great. Thank you. John, please. Well, thank, thank you very much, both of you, for the framework and for the analysis and, and for the recommendations. Just um, point out, particularly the analysis, Mike, um, your two folks' pedigrees, I hope, would help us all um, appreciate the integrity of, of this kind of analysis um, and, and the credibility of it. So I really appreciate that. Um, question um, Using Phil's framework, uh, one of the, when we had this discussion that Eileen and Cassandra and with Phil Rogers and the Legislative Committee, Bob Emerson and some of the proposal like architects of the day were talking about um, these topics. And, and Bob mentioned, you know, we may have gone too far in worshiping at the God of equity in the form of sort of more equal funding for it, following every student, and that we may be, have lost some commitment or delivery on equity as, I think, Phil, one of the definitions you put out in terms of sort of um, equal treatment and delivering outcomes. I think Bob was arguing that we need to get back more to um, better, more more robust support for kids who are further to travel, for kids, kids of color. And I was struck you know, by Massachusetts um, outperforming even among their poor kids, because one of the challenges we face in looking at states, Massachusetts isn't quite like us in its demographics, but if they have a policy regime and a funding regime and a school organization regime that is succeeding with uh, the poor kids who have further to travel, and we learn something from that. And so I just pose back to you, is, is, is putting more effort behind those who have further to travel a direction you didn't include um, that type of idea as one of the recommendations, except indirectly, or probably directly, for early childhood yeah. and earning tax credit. Well, you've seen nationally uh, from the uh, focus on equity issues, particularly in the 1970s in the school reform movement, you, you've seen it shift somewhat, uh, and we talk about that in, in the book that we did, uh, to this concern, uh, increasing concern with adequacy. Uh, not to give up on equity, but to really home in on the question of adequacy. Are you providing enough? Uh, we talk about Massachusetts. One of the things, in addition to what Mike noted about Massachusetts in its early days, is they did a cost study. Um, and they said, well, if we're going to set out a program that calls for these, this kind of activity, these kinds of programs to reach these goals, what's it going to cost? And that truly is a question of adequacy. Uh, and, and they uh, incorporated some of that in, into the kinds of things they did. So they got a better sense of um, what you're going to have to spend to provide an adequate education. And uh, I would certainly concur with that. Thank you. Richard. <coughs> um, yeah, I appreciate your uh, 
uh, presentation, I'm I'm inspired to buy uh, buy your book, uh, <laughs> which I, it's a bad habit of mine. Signed Phil later has one in Very good. Yeah. Buy, um, buy lots of copies. <coughs> we made is we sold the manuscript to, <laughs> rather than get the royalty. I hear you. Uh, but my question uh, is on uh, Mipsers. Now, does this represent legacy costs, costs that should have been paid? by the education budget in a previous year that's been put off? Or is there some other aspect to the MIPSERS problem that um, uh, other than simply having, having in, in good times we, we spent more than or we took on obligations that we didn't pay for at the time and now, now the bill's coming due when we're least able to, to pay it? Is, is that my understanding of the, the issue? I think we're sort of a um, victim of uh, demographics and uh, the baby boomers retiring. Uh, and Mipsers, as I, my, my impression was, it's always been a, 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 an attractive but defensible program for the teachers in our schools, and we're just kind of caught now by you know the size of the uh, the, the workforce contributing in uh, it's, it's like social security and, and the size of uh, the people who have worked very very hard and have now earned those benefits and the bill becomes due um, I, I don't know um, if something perhaps greater contributions might have been made in in previous years um, one change that was introduced with proposal a and we was that uh, what was a dramatic increase in state funding for the schools uh, was accompanied by um, the state giving the full responsibility for covering the cost to the local school districts. Mm. Um, now, is, is the current dilemma due to proposal, to, to proposal A? Well, I'd say not necessarily. Um, we've had, uh, you know, Mike mentioned this early, we've had a lot of tax cuts. In, in the state in recent years. Uh, uh, Charlie Ballard, who I, I take my cues on the Michigan economy from uh, Charlie, I think he knows as much about it as anyone. He talks about termites eating away at the tax base and, and, uh, and has been doing it, and, and that's been going on for some years. So we are now in a position, yes, where they, the school districts um, have this substantial burden, and the burden has been um, recognized by the governor, and they have recommended appropriations into the trust fund. Um, I, I don't know if, if that's, that's sort of my perspective on it. Can I mention that I, I'm on the retirement board by position. The state soup has a seat. And uh, in addition to what I think that Mike said, part of it is the investment portfolio went down the drain during the recession. Mm. So to match what they would have to match in order to be able to pay out even the existing folks was a burden. And then uh, also to Mike's point on the demographics, you get to a point where there's even a, there's even a catch-22 that now new teachers are half and half. They're half in the old system and half in a 401k. So they're not quite contributing what had been contributed. So there's this kind of transition time that makes it difficult. And, you know, to emphasize this slide, to see how much of a burden this is on school districts, with the sleight of hand, I would call, I wrote an article 20-some years ago when it was shifted from the state to the, to the local and said, you know, let's take a deep breath here. We're getting lots of extra money for the per pupil, but we own this from here on in. Mm -hmm. That was a smart move on the part of the state. Um, but what ends up happening is, I think it's, it's about 25% now. So if you're a $100 million budget and you have an $80 million payroll, which is kind of, or let, let's say to make the numbers right, you have an $80 million, $100 million payroll, you're paying $25 million right off the top before you ever even, this is the controversy about what goes to the classroom, before you even start to think about buying books, paying teachers and the rest. Now on the other hand, it's going to the classroom because a lot of people are attracted to the profession because they have a, it, it's a good retirement system or you know, had been. So. Um, and then I do think the fact that, that the contribution's been made on the top, I mean, I found myself in this argument even on the show, the Scubic show earlier, that, you know, people in the field were asking me in my role here when Governor Granholm was here, and this isn't faulting her, it was easier said than done, the money was particularly tough then, but don't put it in the foundation, because if you put it in the foundation, it makes it look like we have money that immediately we have to turn over to the fund, 
could she pay it off the top? That didn't happen. It's happening now. So I, I just think if we're not careful, we would we would probably tempt fate from the governor and others to say the heck with it. Let's put it in the foundation and not pay it off the top because it is it, in that sense it's a contribution to that would have had to have been paid anyway, as, as Mike and Phil said earlier. But I do think the pension fund is really, I learned more about it by being on this board. It's, it, it, it's such a function. They have to pay in any given year a certain amount based on what's happened with the investment portfolio. So that can also, you know, when that thing just dipped dramatically in 07 or 08 or whenever that was, uh, no. Does, and a related question, does the closing of districts like Buena Vista and Angster affect the retirees from those districts? No. If they were, I mean, either they, hopefully they're vested. They, they, they're vested. Okay. You're vested after, well, under the new system, I'm not sure anymore, but it used to be vested after uh, five years, I guess. So even though those districts are no longer contributing to MIPSERS, they're out of the, the whole, the statewide foundation, not. Uh, well, presumably those teachers went somewhere, and that district now is making the contribution. But they're also getting foundation money. So if the Buena Vista kids, let's say, they went largely to, if I'm remembering, uh, uh, Frankenmuth and Saginaw, yeah. they're getting the foundation for those kids, and then out of that, they're paying, they're paying part of that, a lot of that. This is what you know. All these other graphs are really startling to see, to say the least. But this is maybe the hidden reason about why it's such a burden for schools to do what they could have done 20 years ago right in the classroom because you have this used to be paid by the state. I mean, I'm assuming, Mike, you were, you were the advisor at the time. Uh, you probably saw that the demographics were such that the state was going to not be able to handle yeah, it. Yeah, when, when the Proposal A um, ideas were, were surfacing, um, almost any idea, you know, it had its pluses and its minuses, and the, the, the looming uh, retirement costs were, were an issue, just as uh, the stability of some new revenue sources was raised some questions, too. Yeah. I think it was Cassandra, then Dan, then Eileen, then Michelle. Well, this is really enlightening, so thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. I just have a quick question. Um, on the one slide, you show clearly that income in Michigan has dramatically decreased. Mm -hmm. And then on another slide you show state revenue and uh, constitutional revenue limit under uh, the Headley Amendment. And there's, I mean, there's a dramatic decrease um, in the taxes. And I'm wondering what you would attribute that to. Is it tax cuts? Is it, is it reductions in property values? Uh, you know, what, what, what would account for such a, a dramatic decline on this slide? It, I think it's, well, it's a series of uh, tax reduction bills passed in the legislature. And, and to me, it, it represents kind of a, a secular change in thinking. I mean, I think that the, pub, the, the, the um, public attitude toward the public sector has changed in Michigan in recent years. That's how I interpret it. The, the change we're looking at there is it's not cyclical. It's, it's secular. It's, it's not a response to either uh, <coughs> a recession or a period of economic growth. It's just a uh, changing attitude about um, the extent to which we will support public sector activity. Dan? Yeah, go ahead. Good. Right. Um, so let me add my thanks to the chorus of those um, being sung. Two quick questions. Uh, one is, so when I look at the NAEP score slides that you showed, um, I look at the top 10, and just for the benefit of my colleagues at the table here, New Mexico happens to be the 11th state on both, so and above New Mexico. Um, so I notice that there are states that I would think of as left-leaning states, and there are states that I would think of as right-leaning states, kind of mm -hmm. both in the top 10. Uh, and we try and depoliticize kind of education as much as possible at this table. Um, Sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, I'm just wondering, would it be fair to kind of take away from the fact that there are both left and right leaning states, if you will, in the top 10, that like the issue here is not kind of uh, the ideological agenda. Like it could, education can work regardless of your ideological agenda. It just needs to be coherent. Is that the right takeaway or is it
just kind of random. We shouldn't take anything away from that. That's question number one. <laughs> <laughs> question number two is, um, so one, one potential path here would simply be to adopt another state's policies whole cloth right, that's actually producing good outcomes. Um, and rarely, sometimes, I, Florida kind of last year seemed to be gaining that kind of um, uh, cachet. cachet in the state <laughs> legislature, right. Um, whether that's the right state or not, that's not the question. The mm -hmm. question is, why, like, what are the relative advantages, disadvantages of doing that? You know, is that a simple way to think about this? And should we? Should we just like go to Massachusetts and just you know like take their laws and adopt them in whole cloth or what have you? Just what's your reaction mm -hmm. to that notion? Yeah, I, I would say it's. I think it's it's useful to look at states that have had some success, um, and, and take a close look at their policies. And, and, and by a close look, I mean not just that they have adopted some forms of choice, let's say, but how have they really implemented it? Um, have they done something with respect to uh, curriculum or the, uh, the in-servicing of their teachers? And not just whether they instituted policy A or B, but how did they do it? Um, you, you, you may discover states that um, have introduced forms of choice and have kind of done so as sort of a substitute for increasing resources. And you might find another state that has introduced different forms of school choice while at the same time increasing resources, sort of looking upon a choice pol pro-choice policy plus resources as complements as opposed to substitutes. And probably many different ways, perhaps, to uh, Im improve outcomes in the schools. And um, yeah, you could, you could very well find uh, states that are left-leaning and right-leaning that have, that have had that success. But I think uh, you, know, you need to know more than, well, this, this state introduced a, uh, let's say, a charter school program uh, in 2000, and now they have uh, 285 charter schools. You want to take a close look at uh, the governance and oversight of those schools. What is the relationship between the, uh, the charter schools and the traditional schools? Um, the, the, there's a lot at work here. And then you're also going to, if, you, if you're going to look at educational outcomes, you really want to look at the state of the economy uh, in those areas too, to see what the what employment rates are, uh, what has happened with population gains or losses. So I, I think you're right not to, to, to try to um, sort of pre-sort the, the high achieving states to, to begin with. Just take a look at what they're doing. And as you do that, I think you have to look at what are the negative consequences of some of the policies that they've adopted. I mean, do they play out and balance off, or don't they? Thank you. Eileen was next, I think, and then Kath, and then <coughs> Michelle. Excuse me. So this is the moment where I say to you that after eight years on the National Assessment Governing Board and one on FIPSI, the Fund for Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, I am now channeling for the National Center for Education Statistics. I have no choice but to say to you, Mike, that it's fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade for Nate. It's fourth and eighth for Pearls. I'm sorry, for Tim's and 15 for Pisa. Uh, Tim's I and I think. You, I I'm so sorry. You know what else? I've got this odd. <laughs> I, I, my, my voice seems to have descended into the basement. So, and I'm only, this is such a minor point, but I'm only saying it for the board's benefit because um, sometimes these things come up for comparability. The, the um, uh, questions that I have um, are really because we're all trying to get this into a pot that makes sense so that we can figure out what to do with it. So I'm not, I don't have a political agenda. I just, I do have, if there is such a thing, a public policy common stats sanity program because I'm still, we are hearing so much about local district millages not impacting state funding, which is a burden the taxpayers should, should share and should be distributed. So these, these numbers have nothing to do with local millages. I just want to verify that. And there's no, these, are, these are only state tax dollars that are in your charts. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that your appropriations chart does go through the governor's projections. It like actually goes through 2014, but the reporting only goes through 2012. And I don't know if that's available, but given 
the um, there I've, I've been talking to members of the legislature and there is support for improving the foundation allowance but there's also uh, people who feel very strongly that uh, funding for education doesn't seem to bear a straightforward uh, relationship to student achievement and it would be helpful if those numbers are available right now to uh, add them to to this report which will be going forward from here um, there are all of us have to make arguments on this and uh, uh, the more data you can give us, um, the healthier that will be. Um, there's, uh, when you talk about a reluctance to fund uh, public programs in the same way as before, there's no question on that. And one of the things that I've been encountering when I talk to legislators is the uh, overwhelming concern about the balance between corrections costs and early childhood. People are getting that there's a relationship, which is very healthy. <clears throat> there, in this state, of all states, we're really worried about transportation, about roads, because they're falling apart now. It's a bill that we didn't pay, just like MIPSERS may not have been funded, wasn't funded on a, an ongoing basis. Um, and then you start adding in health care costs. So the choices are really hard, and anything we can do to uh, qualify um, these, all of these complex relationships, as, as Dan was asking, can we just adopt Massachusetts <laughs> and go for it? Will that fix it? <laughs> But um, because there are not a lot of connections, we, we've had certainly seen the number of districts uh, fail financially, um, and yet they had a ton of money coming in. Um, Craig cited the, the, uh, the uh, per pupil spending that was going on in a number of these districts, and it's really difficult for us to struggle with how you can find policies. As John was saying, how do you prioritize money? If you, if you know that you're giving money to districts that aren't making good choices, what mechanisms do we have as, at a state level, for example, to guarantee that MIPSERS um, going forward uh, uh, is, is funded enough to be solvent? And if we divert money to have to pay for the past, how do you balance that against money for the future? Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I had one more comment. Uh, it actually, it was the disconnect between public guarantees and how promises are made and by whom and kept. And the question for, that I would have, one of the questions I would have is, is there any way to be proactive? Have you, in the work you've done in other states, um, seen anything that really works for retirement costs and for the decentralization and decision making that we have here? It's a public liability. It's one of the few things that can actually accrue to a homeowner's uh, uh, household tax burden. I mean, it's a, it, it could be levied. It's, uh, it's a real issue for Michigan. And I've forgotten, Mike may know the stat, the last thing I, last time I heard it was about fifty thousand dollars per household, but that's, that's. I love the phone ring. I need to know. Where <laughs> <it is. laughs> but but there is a number that's that's pretty pretty substantial. Is it okay. So, uh, there's a number that's substantial that is um, a real burden to taxpayers for the past. And how do we make? How do we find a way as a state to make sure that that can't happen again? Uh, especially when you hear the cries for um, teachers not being treated well, you know, not being uh, being abused by the public. It's just complicated. <coughs> so any thoughts you have on that would be really helpful to us because as you look at these numbers, they are accompanied by people. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure out how to encourage the people to do a great job right now, especially with the changes we're facing in education, is, is a substantial issue. Yeah. I think say, when you look at Massachusetts, and I, I, I haven't looked at it in great depth, but they seem to have sort of arrived at a kind of a, what you might call a grand bargain, where they um, adopted very ambitious standards for the children in the schools, and at the same time, they substantially increased the resources available to the schools. And I, I think that, that that sort of grand bargain is, is something that I, I think we, we should keep in mind. Thank you. Kathleen, Michelle, Richard, Dan. Thank, thank you, Mike. Well, it's great to have both of you here. It's great to have a kick off this year-long, or almost year-long review when educating us and the public, we hope, and the legislators, maybe. Yeah, be very helpful. One of the points, I'm, when you talk about Massachusetts, when we adopted our, our grade-level content expectations, we were competitive. There were three M's. They saw that Massachusetts, Maryland, and Michigan had the highest standards. And we were touted as having, you know, this was really good. But the trick is that Massachusetts put in resources. <coughs> we just adopted the standards and then didn't put in the resources to do it. But that was, that's one of the things. But the, the, the chart you had on uh, showing how we're so below 
the, the Headley limit is really very revealing. I, I was not aware of that. That was, that, that really tells we have a lot of, we could really raise taxes and not be, it wouldn't be hitting that. We can't use the Headley Amendment as an excuse for not raising taxes. Yeah, I, I sort of look at that as that graphic as, as reflective of kind of a change in attitude. It's like back back in the day of, of uh, Richard Headley and, and even in the, the first term of Governor Engler, um, we, we as a state were pretty close to that constraint and we, we operated with it in yeah. mind. And we've just backed so far away from that now, it's, it's no longer an issue. And I think it, it just kind of reflects the, yeah. the, the, the shrinking public uh, realm uh, in the state. Yeah, because Eileen mentioned the, the road, so difficult yeah. to drive. I mean, it, it really is a, amazing. You like got a washboard, or as well as you. Yeah. Know, <laughs> I'm starting to feel like Nairobi. Right. <laughs> it's really terrible, and yet the legislature seems absolutely opposed to raising taxes to to fix the roads, or to attempt to fix the roads. But uh, I like I like your four areas, Phil. That that we should be looking at. And one of them, the, the equity one, and, and Mike, uh, John raised something too about that. I remember going back many years with Al Pelham. You remember Al Pelham but in Detroit and Wayne County. He was an outstanding finance expert. And he used to talk about equal opportunity means unequal resources. I mean, you need to put more resources in the areas that need them the most in order to provide equal opportunity. And he, he put it in that context so that you wouldn't give the same amount to every district. You'd have to give certain districts that have more, more hard to educate children or who are at risk children, however you want to rephrase it, more resources. And that was the whole idea of compensatory education and everything else. So I think, that, I think that's still a a good way to look at it, that equal opportunity means... Well, very much so. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you take the notion of equity and apply it to uh, the question of finances, and particularly the allocation of those to school districts, there's been some wonderful work done uh, in the past, and one of the pieces of work really splits equity into three pieces when you look at a state school aid program. One is called horizontal equity, which really, in a sense, argues that you ought to have a good foundation and a base under everybody. And the, the second notion is, is called vertical equity, and it says, well, there are, there are good and justifiable reasons uh, for giving some districts more because of the nature of the students they are dealing with, whether it's vocational education or whether it's special education. And the third one was, was what was called it the quality of opportunity. It maybe became to, to talk about fiscal neutrality. And that's in effect what Michigan did to some extent with the, with the reforms. And that was to get rid of factors um, that really were negative factors on what was going to be available in terms of resources, i.e. the property tax back in that time. So that if you were sitting in a school district with a healthy property tax base versus one with an unhealthy property tax base, there was a tremendous amount of inequity in, in that arrangement, as, as we all know. And so uh, they, they really talked about, as you look at this, build the base, uh, put more into it for good reason, and make sure that there are no negative factors working against uh, ending up with an equitable situation. Thank you, Phil. One other thing I want to yes, mention that Mike talked about was the recommendation on the capital taxing for capital purposes. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I remember, we I visited a school, went to schools in Hamtramck, and the buildings were really old. The newest building was built in 1930 uh, or something. And if they tried to levy a millage or a bond issue, they, they couldn't raise enough money because the property was worth so little. Mm -hmm. So there was such, even if they wanted to do it, they couldn't get approval from the Treasury Department to do it because it wouldn't raise any money. Yep. So that, that's such an unequal, that's a really unequal scene, the, the capital infrastructure. Yeah, I remember that uh, some school districts were deemed to be too property poor to participate in the Michigan School Bond Loan Fund. Right, that's and what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that, that's, 
that's an area that we really haven't focused on at all, and we really should. I right, think it's not addressed in the Proposal that. A at all. But of course now we're closing schools, so we're not building new schools except in certain areas. We've got all kinds of problems to deal with the old districts, with the old buildings, and growing districts with new buildings. How do we equalize it? It's, 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 Anyway, this is great. Thanks very much to both of you. Thank you, Kath, for getting that on the table. Hamtramck is the poster child of that. It's frightening on how they just can't raise the money even if they wanted right. to. And, and even back when I was at Wayne Reese as a superintendent, the conditions are right. very unsafe. Uh, Michelle and Richard and Dan. Oh. And I was going to be last. Yes, thank you. This was, I thought this was a great... Um, uh, study. Um, I think it's very important to look at issues of, you know, the financial aspects of what we actually invest um, as a state and looking at issues of, of poverty. Um, I remember looking at, well, there's one thing I want to say, and it's not directed at you. It's, I keep seeing people misrepresent the NAEP scores and not get it right and what it means in the press, and it's driving me out of my mind. To be considered proficient, you're an A student. To be considered basic, you're still passing, and that is considered a, you know, a CB student. And, and the advanced is a, a solid A plus, and that would make about one third <laughs> of our population, <coughs> you know, what are in the schools, not uh, are in the basic. But people keep missing the proficient with the MEEP. Sorry, I just had to get that mm -hmm. out, and because so many intelligent people are getting it wrong. Um, so my question to you is one of the, I'm, I'm curious about Massachusetts or other states and what they're actually doing. Um, and I was looking at some, some of the research that John had actually um, called together with folks from Michigan State. And one of the things that seemed to be very unique about Michigan is that we have very high concentrations of poverty. So, and I'm not sure how that compares to other states including Massachusetts. And if there are things we should consider because of that. And, that you know, it's the it's where we have, and that's where it seems to be the m most difficult to affect um, education when there's these high concentrations, uh, or large concentrations of poverty in in, in our state. Um, and so I, I'm looking to see what has done in Massachusetts. I'm particularly interested in this idea of balancing that choice and the equity, and but also given our sort of unique circumstances around poverty, um, especially because we also tend to have very big dips because of our industry or manufacturing mm -hmm. and car industry. So um, so I, I don't know if my question is clear. Or is, uh, so I'm looking to see, um, so what are, what are some of the specific things that they're doing in Massachusetts to balance choice, equity, um, um, efficiency, uh, adequacy, and are there things that we should be paying attention to in Michigan given sort of our unique what makes us different from these other states? Uh, Sorry. That's a good question. <laughs> I think you'd almost have to look first at uh, what each of the states is doing, or at least at the states that you're interested in. Right. What they're doing is going to probably fund public education and allocate those funds out. And what is it that they do with that? Um, and, and that might be helpful to be able to take a look at that. I mean, what is it that Massachusetts does, for example, in addressing this business and vertical versus what Michigan is doing? And, and is, is there something there to be pursued in fall? So, but short of looking, I think, at all of those, or at least at the programs in effect in the, the states you're looking at, I mean, the, the Massachusetts and Florida were mentioned. And, I think you hear that Massachusetts is doing wonderful things, and you hear about some of the wonderful things that Florida is doing, but you also hear about some of the negative consequences that are, that are coming about in Florida. So you got to just stop and look at all of these things. Right. Yeah. Just a couple of differences between uh, Michigan and Massachusetts that come to mind is um, the, the approach toward school choice is, is a bit different. Uh, in Massachusetts, as I understand it, they have one authorizing entity. It's a state-level entity that will, that will uh, provide for the, the creation of a charter public school. 
Uh, I don't think they have um, the level of charter and choice activity that we have here in Michigan. And of course, the other the other difference is that uh, in in terms of uh, per pupil support for the schools, in Massachusetts, uh, in 2011. Um, invested about a little over $13,100 per pupil. Comparable figure for Michigan at that time was about $10,800. Uh, I'm sure there are other very important differences too. Those are the, just two that come to mind. Yeah. So the, the entity, I just, I, I did have some other, just a couple other questions. Um, one is the the state revenue, this, this graphic here that looks at the Headley Amendment. Um, so this goes to Nine. I'm just wondering um, if there's any mm -hmm. um, what it, if you know what it was for more recently in the last like four years. I don't, years? but I think I can find out and, okay. and get that too. If it's gone, because there was a lot of changes in eleven. That mm -hmm. seemed to, I'm just my guess is that well, maybe you should guess <laughs> 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 is that it's uh, there's less taxes going towards the. Would that be fair to say that there's Th that the gap is is widened even more yes. in recent years since uh, um, eleven? Well, uh, it could be. I mean, the the uh, incomes have been recovering, and some yeah. additional so tax cuts changes. have been proceeding. So, uh, it's it's possible. But I, I will uh, be happy to uh, try to track that down for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard then okay. Dan, and we're finished with Craig, and then we're going to have our students. Okay. Uh, I had two uh, issues, I guess, and I'll, I'll throw them out instead of both at once. Uh, I'll throw out one and then I'll come back to the other. Uh, the one is when we talk about comparing Michigan performance with other states, for a decade or more, our admission to, to the system, to kindergarten, has been at December 1st, while the vast majority of other states have been at September 1st. So our student body is about five, that's about 5% of your lifespan when you're five. And uh, so, so our kids are 5% younger or thereabouts uh, going through the system. And um, when you're younger, you don't, you don't learn quite as much or quite as efficiently as, as, uh, as your peers. Uh, could this account for uh, this could account for perhaps 5% of uh, why we're behind other states. Now, this board last year uh, made the decision to raise the, uh, the age level for children entering in, but this is a, a circumstance that I find uh, rarely, if ever, mentioned or acknowledged when, when we're comparing Michigan students and their performances. Uh, I realize that when you're comparing gains on, on the NAEP, then that, that's not relevant to that particular mm -hmm. one, although conceivably it could be if kids are less able, less able to learn, then they're probably less able to gain and such. But, uh, but your thoughts or response to that and, and is our raising uh, the, the age level of children going into kindergarten going to pay off uh, in, in perhaps stronger performance across the board. Yes, my, my impression is that the um, entry level age to kindergarten might have a sort of a, a marginal <coughs> effect on these um, gain score measures that we have here. Um, if we looked at level scores, what we would see over the years from, from the early 90s to today is that Michigan has slipped quite a bit. I don't know if the, 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 pol the policy that you mentioned has been in place over that time, um, I, I think it may it, it may be a contributor, but my sense is it wouldn't be a, a big one. But you, there are there are early childhood experts who would know a lot more about that than uh, than I do. Okay, I do think another factor that you inferred earlier was we're at about what forty percent of our kids are in free and reduced lunch, um, and that's dramatically different than even ten years ago when the auto industry was thriving. So these are all a lot of the points being made oh, today. Yes. Um, Dan and then Craig. Uh, three quick things. One is a correction. So on oh, the composite sorry. score gain, I'm sorry, did you have something else? That was my fault. I didn't realize it was a follow-up. So yeah. Thanks. Um, and, and the other is related to this because it is a question, you know, is uh, the role of preschool, uh, is, it, is it development, which happens whether we 
uh, naturally because of internal growth or is it because of external experience? Preschool can make up for the latter, but not for the former. And I, I have seen the claims made for money invested in uh, uh, 03 and 45 here, and uh, as, as you presented here, and I've read one or two of those studies, um, and I guess my question is, is there any documentation? We've had Head Start in Michigan for about 50 years. Is there any documentation that the money we've invested in Head Start in Michigan has um, uh, saved us money in the long run for, for school costs? Uh, we, we do have experience with preschool programs. We, we have a couple of generations now. There ought to be, uh, rather than the studies that I've read, have depended on speculation. Uh, is, there, is there actual proof that Head Start has made a difference? Uh, um, there, there is definitive proof that uh, high quality early education, uh, such as the, the Perry Preschool Program in Ypsilanti, has had great benefits. To society, I think that I think the departments a few years ago did an evaluate an evaluation study of the Great Start program, and, and if I if I'm remembering it correctly, um, it, it was a well done study that did conclude that um, there were there were substantial social benefits um, resulting from that initial investment. But the 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 studies of the the Perry Preschool. Uh, experiment sort of remains kind of a gold standard of educational research and that the, the data have been scrutinized uh, by many teams and the um, the return on investment is is uh, sub very substantial and, and that has been used to justify further investment in Head Start uh, which is why I ask has this small less than a thousand students study been able to be replicated on a grand scale, scale as supposedly Head Start was? Um, to my knowledge, no. It would be the, the returns on the Perry program are, was so dramatic, in part because the Perry program was an expensive, very high quality program. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, pupils to uh, teacher ratio was about four or five to one. All of the teachers in that program were veteran teachers with dual certifications in early childhood education and special education. The, and as you know, the, the program included a, an in-home visitation weekly. Uh, if we wanted to do the Perry program today in Michigan on a per-pupil basis, it would probably cost uh, $11,000 a child. Given all of that, the expected benefits would be, um, gosh, it, it could, you know, estimates have been as high as $12 or $13 of benefit for each dollar invested in the program. Head Start is something different, um, different goals, Different rules, and it hasn't different. Reached out so far, in a time frame. Right. Abs oh yeah, it, it, it hasn't been scrutinized as as closely as Perry, but it, I, I would say the the department study of a few years ago was about the best study that that, that I've seen on it. And that's the one we have discretion over, so we're comfortable with the continued um, investment in that. I, you know, it's interesting that. Um, well, I'm going to let it sit because we got students waiting. Dan and then Craig. Um, I'm not going to let it sit. That's actually one of my few things. So I'm going to come back to that. I'm really glad that early childhood uh, uh, has become a part of this discussion. Um, uh, so two things, I guess. One is um, just a quick correction. On the composite scale score gains um, chart, the top ten end with Pennsylvania. Uh, so New Mexico squeaks in. They're number nine. Uh, so the folks know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All the New Mexico residents tuning in. That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, but for colleagues here who are just trying to figure out who the top 10 is, <coughs> uh, uh, Pennsylvania is the number 10. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I almost don't even, uh, so I was just going to like throw early, just going to say thank you so much for including that <laughs> as one of your recommendations. Like I, I so the Perry Preschool study is very convincing. The Great Start Readiness Program study that was shared with us at this table here within the last, I don't know, eight, nine months was very convincing. Um, uh, and while the Head Start studies suggest that there's some washout at third grade, once again, the evidence now, given the decades of research that have been done, suggests that 
you see tremendous gains down the road in terms of incarceration rates, in terms of employment, in terms of high school graduation, retention rates, special education rates, and the cost savings are tremendous, um, which is why we do see bipartisan support for early childhood education um, investment now uh, in the state. Thank goodness. Um, and given your statement, um, Michael, I think it was you that made this statement, that um, it, you're hard-pressed to find, I think you said, and it may have been a casual statement, but um, my sense is that you don't make too many casual statements, <laughs> mm -mm. Uh, that you would be hard-pressed to find a better investment than investment into high-quality early childhood education. Mm -hmm. um, I think is striking. Uh, and I, I, I continue, so I just want to use this opportunity to continue to encourage this table and the folks at this table to spend more time and energy on conversations about early childhood education. What does high quality early childhood education look like? How can we create policies that support the implementation and you know, practice of high quality early childhood education? Um, there's a lot of stuff in the K-12 world to think about and worry about for sure. And I think the evidence is accumulating that the time that we spend, spend on some of that would be better spent talking through how to better support high quality early childhood education in this state. And that's part of our purview. Why don't I commit um, to get on agenda planning uh, that opportunity? Because I think some of the differences or perceived differences are about the quality issue. And I think the more that we can say there are some programs that aren't of high quality, that's what we're struggling through right now with our new Great Start Department as we got folks in from DHS and other places, even kind of traditional daycare. So I think there's a way for us to help frame that and then support high quality, not support low quality, because I think what you can fall into a trap on is early childhood for early yeah. childhood's sake when it's what's the, okay. Thank, I'm trying to thank you so much. And, and I guess implicit in my question is, is Head Start high quality? And if it's not, how are we going to avoid that mistake of spending a lot of money on a program that isn't high quality? We, we so have I'm, a lot to offer on that now. We spend money on the Great Start Readiness Program, which is not Head Start. I mean, right. it's, a, it's a different program, so I'm not, I, like, I think the conversation's worth having as long as what we're having is a conversation about how to make sure Great Start is a high-quality program, not about Head Start, which... Yeah. I, I, I'll commit to bring to the table that we'll work on that and suggest a time frame. And, and that's, and by the way, not to concede that Head Start's not a high-quality program. I would actually take issue with that. I think it's implemented uh, kind of, you know, a variety of different levels across the country, um, and I wouldn't want to ever see it defunded. Mm -hmm. But rather, I think that what we should be doing is making Head Start high-quality, universally high-quality around the country. That's that U of M law degree that's that right. got that yeah. last uh, yeah. caveat <laughs> in. And on that point, I guess for a moment, Kath and Michelle, yeah. if you had it, and then we'll go to Craig. Well, I, I agree with, with Dad. We've been pushing for high-quality Head Start for a long, long time. And uh, we have raised, we have developed standards and high-quality standards, which we've approved. So we, we've taken a lot of steps in that direction. But I wanted to mention to Richard that the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis a number of years ago did a very good study on, on the value the investment of pre in preschool dollars and the return on the investment. And I think that study helped to convince a lot of business people that this was a way to go. They came here, the president of the bank came here a few years ago and met with a lot of people and they really started meeting with the business community in, in, in great force in those days. So that was a, that was a very high quality study, Richard, that, that was highly regarded. What's the name of it again? We'll get you that. It's in fact he did it ten years ago first. He's the Federal Reserve. Uh, he had been the Federal Reserve Chair in Minneapolis, uh, the sub chair, and we'll we'll track that down. Up on it. There we go. Michelle is on this topic. Yep. Okay, please. Well, and then, and then Craig. It's on finance. It's on. Oh, good. It's okay. The only reason I'm. It early. No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I've just been reading a lot of sort of debate now about the um, retirement program and um, some folks, somebody even characterized it as like a zombie or something that was eating school children or, so there's a, it's very <laughs> politicized. <laughs> I was in Congress yesterday. Um, so it's becoming really politicized and I see that it's almost like saying, you know, the argument is that it's these selfish overpaid, overcome, kind of feeding into that um, anti-public uh, investment or public uh, sector 
uh, funding sort of argument that um, sometimes takes the, the the frame of demonizing public servants. But um, so uh, so I so I'm wondering with this. I, I feel that there's going to be some. You know, it's coming to a head. What's going to happen with this retirement program? And and uh, you know, without people really understanding all the strains that have defunded the retirement program. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any given any thought to, you know, uh, recommendations or ideas of where we should go in the future with with um, masters. So any, any thought? Mm -hmm. I, solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have one while you're thinking. Just I, I do think there's danger, as Michelle's pointing out, that one of the reasons we get high quality people is because we've had a fair and a good system that we need to continue to fund. And then I think they tried to mitigate these problems with this kind of split pension for new employees, kind of like the auto industry and others have done. But yeah, I, I think it is we need to be careful because it's these are legitimate costs. They're high though. It's just a point out they're very high whether it's the state picks it up or the local and and uh, and it, where I was caught a little bit this morning even on the radio thing is this is if you're supporting classroom teachers you're supporting the classroom now maybe not the way that people are trying to see the dollars fund funneled in for books but if you're supporting teachers with good pensions you're also supporting the classroom and that's what one of the reasons people are attracted to the profession I'm almost done. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Go ahead, so because one of the one of the things that I've you know I don't understand um, why schools have to opt opt out of it, and um, there's so many schools, given the proliferation of charters and now cybers, um, that have the right to opt out, and so I I'm just you know looking if I'm assuming that in Massachusetts they probably because they have one entity that falls under a, a broader you know, it's more controlled um, that they're they're less likely to have sort of this uh, drain on the uh, the um, the retirement program. So I'm just wondering if that's uh, that's something that's been looked at um, because as we keep going and going and going with this policy of unlimited and without um, any sort of uh, with more and more schools and teachers being compensated less and also being compensated less through the uh, through the retirement program um, it just seems it's going to be inevitable and there's a lot of teachers out here that are very concerned about their pensions and that they're there's what's happening in Detroit with their pensions may be coming to a head for them as well so I, I you know I given an analysis of it, and I think you've hit on it, that there's been sort of this um, disinvestment in the system. Um, but it, it doesn't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of struggling <coughs> for what are some fair and good and ways to, uh, per, you know, to maintain it without, um, you know, uh, just saying, well, we're just, it's gone broke and we're going to cut everybody's pensions in half or something like that, mm -hmm. and we're doing it for the kids. You know? I mean, I think as a backdrop to that discussion, and those are those are critical issues, and, and I, I, I agree with uh, Michael that uh, a, uh, and it, the, the retirement, you know, people don't go into the profession for the retirement system, but it's a, it's a part of the, the security and the attraction, but I think, um, now keep in mind that over the last uh, decade in, in Michigan, real resources for the public schools has dropped about 10 percent. Uh, you might find estimates uh, are, are plus or minus a, a percentage point, but that that's the reality. And within that constraint, we've got to we've got to fund the classrooms, we've got to we've got to fund the retirement, we've got to have competitive salaries, we've got to deal with the fact that public schools are chronically short of uh, science teachers, mathematics teachers, special education is also a, uh, an area of chronic shortage. And we, we've got to recognize that there is a market out there for professional talent. Right. And the schools must be competitive. We're going to end with Craig, otherwise the kids are going to get on the bus and leave us <laughs> okay, before they're... Before they're uh, <coughs> well, one comment to Phil is, and I don't know if it's part of a recommended framework or it's overarching. But I think the, the study of effective, vigilant governance 
has to be part of any kind of a long-term education plan for the state. Oh, well, I would agree. Governance. I would agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, second, uh, you saw that that look like bell chart on student enrollment peaking and declining. Well, if you didn't catch it, SEMCOG is projecting in the next 10 years that the student age enrollment population in Southeast Michigan is going to drop by 112,000 kids, which is 13 uh, percent drop in, in 10 years. And I think part of any short-term or long-term policy framework has to focus on what do you do with districts in precipitous decline. The combination of choice, charters, and demographics, what do you do with unused buildings with no particular resale value? And should a funding formula actually provide more money to a district in decline in enrollment? than a district that is increasing enrollment, which would be putting our current funding formula right over, head over heels. That's it. That's Any, it. <laughs> well, listen, let me. Oh, uh, by the way, <coughs> one more thing. <laughs> okay. No, you said Finney, sorry. The good, the good news is in 2035, when Phil is, turns 65, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the enrollment increase in Southeast Michigan starts going up again. Wow. So, Kathy, good news for you and me. Yeah, thanks. Can I just say, you know, that <laughs> board members like Kathleen and others know that these are two iconic folks in Michigan who we are proud to say are former deputies here in the department. And as a guy who has 16 meetings left, monthly <laughs> meetings before my retirement, I hope that I'm invited back 10 years later as an expert who could help you work <laughs> through some of these issues because it, on a serious note, it's just uh, really appreciate this start, John. I think it was a great selection to kick this off and um, I'm not under, I'm not overstating this by talking about the iconic uh, folks we have with us today that shared their time. So let's give them a hand and thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. And maybe we'll shift because students are going to come in, so we'll take a pause here for a minute. And if, if you need to take a quick break, might be the time. Okay. I know we're behind, but it take was a, a good discussion. And, and we'll let the uh, students and parents. They list all school it's outside the district. Yeah, I've always liked your, your dog. Your <laughs> like, well, thank you. Try to do it. Where are your red ones? I, I, I have them. <laughs> 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 I can't I usually, if I have to print something, then I want the back line to go to But Headley won't let us do that, which is a shame for me with. And it's, it's impossible to know. There's people you. in the house. I think I see you once you left. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to stay right here. And, and, and I have to say that uh, your, your primer uh, really unlocked the numbers of funding for me. Yeah, so I have this 10,000. We can see. It's only 10,000. From here on out, I'm a lot of fish. No. It goes on, and we'll be here till midnight. I'm going to all about a fish. Yeah, or at least the younger. And, uh, I was going to say, we all are the same. We have to tie our girls to the same generation. My kids if you want, if you were on the fishing meetings, you need the guys who run the people time for me. I would be honored if you would accept my card and if you have any things I don't know on this board, I would have an ID. I wish I could take it to my boardroom. It is like they are always, they are. <laughs> well, I'm a Lutheran minister, so I have a congregation in Taylor. Uh, I look hard, though, if I exist in the village, there's a city politics a lot, and they, they do have their uh, retirement legacy. What I'm going to do right after the board meeting, and the majority of people are going to do that. I don't know. I think it's just really. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. But I don't know. I maybe you know, it's working out of turn. So.
This is our, I have Lupe encouraging me to just start, so I'm going to yes, do that. Just and start. I want to first of all thank all of our guests here before I formally turn this over, and thanks for your patience. This is our highlight of our day, is to see like real students and folks that we're so proud of being here, and to see all kinds of ages, and so it's our pleasure to kick this off. I'm, I know I've got some of our folks at the table that are, you know, Barb, thanks for leading this and for bringing this up to our attention and I think I'll turn it over to Vanessa to yep. kind of kick the formality off. Thank you Mike. Um, so we have been discussing science and science education at this table now for a number of months and so we thought today we would actually take the opportunity um, with the STEM Partnership Awards to highlight one component of our science education programs here in Michigan. So Linda is going to take just a couple minutes to talk about um, STEM Partnership and some science, some issues with that, and then we're going to turn it over to Barbara Bolin. I did want to also um, acknowledge and thank Senator Hopgood for being here today. Um, he has some certificates to hand out to the students later, but we appreciate him joining us for this presentation. So, Linda? Thank you. Uh, we've talked about a variety of entities that are working on science in the state, and one of the ones you've heard about repeatedly is the Mass Science Centers, and uh, they are located around the state. <coughs> one of the things that they, the membership, decided a few years ago was that they were not getting enough emphasis behind STEM and while that is not their actual work 
it was something that they wanted to see go forward because they feel that that's important work and we need it for the economy of Michigan as well as for good science education for our kids. So they undertook through section 99.7, which has $475,000 in funds, to put together a, an entity that would allow us to push forward STEM initiatives across the state. And so the fact that some of you said, talked to Barbara and said, could she bring her kids, gave us the perfect opportunity to just share with you that this is one of the entities. The, Me the Me I'm sorry, the Michigan STEM Partnership uh, was was formed about two and a half years ago, and about a year or two years ago, they hired Barbara Bolin as their executive director. She's been hard at work. Um, she's been to see us. She's talked to you, and she's working on putting initiatives forward to enhance STEM in Michigan. So with that, I'm not going to take any more time away from the kids. I'll turn it over to you, Barbara. Thank you, and I don't intend to take a lot of time either away from the uh, from our. Uh, winners here, but I would like to thank you very much for, for hosting us today. We very much appreciate it, and, and, and we've all been very patient, and we understand you've got really good work to do, and so we, we're, we're not at all abashed by, by being an hour late. We're just delighted to be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I think the, uh, I think the students are particularly uh, excited because they're going to get some, uh, some, some financial gain out of the day, plus a day off school. How mm -hmm. bad can that be, I guess? Um, of course, I would like them to be upset at losing a day of school, but you no, let's face the realities. Um, I've been working uh, for the STEM partnership since January of 2013, so it's been just over a year actually, a year and three months almost, or two months. Um, and uh, we've come a, come a very long way from that very um, uh, sort of informal beginning that, that Linda mentioned. We now have a, a fully fledged uh, board in place as of September 1st um, with 50% uh, representation from the private sector and 50% from the education sector. So we're nicely balanced. A lot of work are going on in, in very enthusiastic committees uh, right now, so I'm personally delighted to, uh, to be helping all of these people do, do really good things. Uh, so I could just set the stage. Back in June of last year, um, we had the opportunity to partner with the National Defense Industrial Association and the Aerospace Industries Association uh, to convene a call to action summit, that's what we ended up calling it, um, that focused on STEM. Uh, and so we had a wonderful event, a day and a half, down at uh, the Henry Ford Museum. And we were rather overwhelmed by the number of people who came. We had more than 100 o o over two days, I mean, on each of two days. So um, we divided the, uh, the participants into groups, because after all, this was a call to action. This wasn't another discussion of the problem. We all know what the problem is, and we're into solutions. Uh, and we divided them into five different groups. There was one that concentrated on elementary uh, education, uh, oh no, sorry, K-12. There was one that focused on community colleges, one that focused on universities, there was one that focused on marketing com communication, and one that focused on uh, legislator, legislative issues and policy. And for a full day, we worked those people extraordinarily hard. So this was in June, remember. At the end of that day, each group reported out, and the Marketing Commun Communication Committee decided amongst several recommendations that we should do something to bring some attention to STEM. And they suggested a competition. Um, so we started working, I started working with, a, with the uh, marketing team, um, and then uh, very quickly we realized that Governor um, Schneider was very kindly going to proclaim October as STEM Awareness Month, and that really brought things to a head. So we thought, well, October is the perfect month to launch and to judge this competition. So this is uh, this was the competition that uh, that we set up. We we would I'd like to uh, to recognise uh, some people uh, before I go on who sponsored this. Uh, without them, there would have been no financial gain for our students, and that's uh, so. This is important. The Hive Foundation, which focuses on STEM, ABB Robotics, the Robot Garage, and TechSmith. And for um, they each donated $500, so we had $2,000 to uh, to work with. So we were able to award prizes of $150 for first prize, second 75. Uh, let me get this right, 75 and 50 for second and third. The students were allowed to work in teams of up to three, uh, and of course that divides the prize money, but they still went ahead and did it. So I was very excited by that, and, and uh, you'll see what in a moment, some of the, some of the results. We ran two, uh, two competitions, really, a video competition that was open to high school students only, um, and they could be homeschooled. As long as they were of high school age, they were fine. Um, and we had uh, limited it to a two-minute uh, total time, and um, we got some, some uh, 
obviously not as many um, responses to that part of the competition as we, uh, as you might think, but then they only had like a month and a half or something to do it, so um, that was remarkable. And then we had the poster competitions, and we divided um, the age groups uh, by through as K through three, four through six, seven through nine, and 10 through 12. So there were four categories, uh, and you are going to see the results of the poster contest. I can't show you the videos because they're up to two minutes a piece, and that just isn't going to be feasible today. But we do have the winners in the room, and they will be duly recognized. Um, I would like to give some credit to some people who, without without whom this would not have, have happened. Um, Mike McIntyre from Oakland Schools uh, was on the marketing team, and without him, I can just tell you, this just never would have happened. I couldn't have pulled it off by myself. Laura Dillon, Dr. Laura Dillon from Michigan State University, Sarah Jacobs from the Robot Garage, and Val Corbett from Macomb Community College. So you see we had people from quite a spectrum who were working on organizing, uh, organizing this. The judging criteria um, we're very clear. There were four categories. Does it send a clear STEM message? Is the work creative and original? Is it artistic? And is there visual clarity? And so we had external judges. We had some, um, as well as the people on the marketing team, Tiffany Dowling from the M3 group, uh, Mark Miano from NBC Education, and Al Lates, who is with the WIN organization, and he's also a STEM board member. So those people really, we really pulled this off uh, very quickly and the, the students have waited patiently for today because we were planning to um, uh, give the awards at our December board meeting, but then we were unable to do that. So this is why you came to our rescue. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is great. Each, just, each winner will get one of these uh, folders and inside are two uh, important things. One's a certificate, this is a recognition of their success. This is the important one. This is the envelope with the check in it. Um, and we will do that uh, later on. So I would just like to very quickly go through the, um, the, the winners of the poster competition. And we're going to start with uh, grades K through three. And this is the third place winner. And I apologize that some of these are busy, but that's because they're artistically done. The students are uh, going to give us hard copies uh, of all of these so that we will do something creative. You'll be able to find these on our website and probably in a newsletter uh, that will be coming to your desk in the next month or so. This is um, uh, third place is Finley Siegel. And you can see the schools. I've put the schools up there as well from, uh, from World Lake. This is second place. This is uh, Maddie Tinsky. Um, and the detail on this you do kind of lose in the slide, but it's quite remarkable. And this is the winner, Ella Barretts uh, from uh, uh, Brick Elementary in Ypsilanti. One of the things that surprised me, but I, from a personal standpoint, gratified me, was the fact that so many of our students took an environmental approach to this. They are concerned about the environment, but given the wonderful natural resources we have in Michigan, that to me was a great thing to see. So um, Ella and I are both tree huggers, I think. Um, <laughs> I like that one. Now let's go to the next category, which is four through six. This is the third place uh, winner. There's a lot going on here. Uh, again, rather hard to see, but there's Mother Earth in the middle um, with everything else going on around it. This is Cameron Brown from uh, Levy Middle School uh, in Southfield. This is a team. This is London James and Ashanti Galloway who got second place. And there's some writing there that again, I, I'm sorry you can't see, but you'll be able to see it on the website. Thomas Chastain from uh, Levy Middle School again in Southfield uh, is the first place winner. Um, and that one's quite uh, very eye-catching, got a lot of. We did hope, by the way, in, if we had been able to present the prizes in December, we wanted to take these, because there are 12 of them, and make a calendar. Um, we're a little late now for a calendar, but who knows? Maybe I can slip in last year's winners with next year's winners next time or something. But um, this would have been a perfect calendar, I think. Um, this is the third place winner. Now this is grades seven through nine, and you'll notice the, the, the obvious difference uh, in the approach. This is Juan Orozco from Summit Academy Romulus, and this is why Senator Hopgood is here. Um, this is in his district, and Senator Hopgood has, um, what are they called, are they Senate? Um, Senate tributes to give to the students from his district. So they will be getting, in addition to their folder, they'll be getting a Senate tribute as well, and this would be one of the winners. Now this is the second place winner. Um, again, a lot going on there, and the more you look at it, the more you see. Uh, this is Callie Hale, again, from the Summit Academy in Rom Romulus. 
This is Max Pellick. Max can't be here today. Max is homeschooled. Um, he's from Northville. And he and his sister both are award winners um, today, but they aren't able to be here. But I had the, the uh, privilege of meeting both them and their and their mother at the RoboFest competition, at which they also did very well. So these are two youngsters who are clearly very much into STEM, but um, that one is, is, is uh, rather eye-catching. Now we get to the, the grown-ups, I guess, <laughs> the grades 10 through 12, and this is the third place winner. This is Molly, Molly Pellick. She's Max's sister, um, and uh, this is interesting, changing the way we live, right? Good theme. Brittany Hobbenstricker from um, Pinckney High School. Um, and again, an, an interesting, very creative poster, that one. Very artistic. And this is the winner in grades 10 through 12. And again, a lot going on there when you really look. This is another team. This is two young ladies from Macomb Mathematics Science Technology Center in, in Warren. So um, that's the end of my presentation today. I would like to just remind you that you have some, uh, you have representation on the Michigan STEM Partnership Board. We have Patty Cantu, who is the Director of Recruiter and Technical Education, and Megan Schroben. Uh, and you also have a guest today, uh, Mike Gallagher, who's from Oakland High School, o Oakland Schools. And he, you'll be hearing from him this afternoon, I understand. So uh, he's also a board member with us. So if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer any, but uh, if you want to go to lunch, that's fine too. <laughs> Eileen, please. Oh, I'm sorry, the video winners. That's, I knew you were going to ask me that. Perhaps the video winners, would you stand up, please? Here we are, and we'll just... <laughs> right. These three gentlemen worked as a team, didn't you? What school are you from? Pioneer. Where? Pioneer. There you go. Would you like to just tell us what your names are? I'm Paolo. Uh, Shane Jerusia. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> and down here we have. Um, Academy, and I'm Brad Yes, that was a. There we are. So congratulations to all. Could we have other students introduce themselves also? We'd like to. If you'd to. like to, absolutely. Yes. Young ladies in the middle. These two students here. Three? 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 Yes, Three. sorry, we missed. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Juana Roscoe. I'm Callie Hale. Brittany Hobbenstricker. You saw their work in my presentation. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the other two young ladies that just introduced themselves. They were part of the, the winning birthday. Do we have anybody else from back here? No? Now, these are some proud parents, I think, that are sitting around the edges here. If you wave to us, we'll know who you are. So thanks for taking the time to be here. And I believe we have grandparents as well. Perhaps the grandparents would like to wave at us. Yeah. And that's it. We'll be going downstairs now for an exchange of um, some of the certificates and some milk and cookies, and then uh, moving on from there. So we thank you. Well, two th thank you. Uh, Gary, and then I have two closing comments. Please, sir. I was sir. wondering if, if any of the students who are here, if their work was shown, if they'd be willing to just briefly tell us a little bit about their, their project. I don't see why not. Okay, Gary. Anybody want to make a comment or two? <laughs> oh. I know you said a couple of them are here, so. <laughs> yeah, tell about your post.
something about those two young ladies. They're very fortunate to be in the, in the class of Jennifer Bond. Jennifer Bond is a third grade teacher who I, uh, I give her the nickname Superwoman. Um, from her, um, I've, I've heard wonderful things about Jennifer. She was featured as one of my STEM stars in one of my newsletters back last fall. She has her own website and she submitted her classes, her class submitted 21 entries for this competition. So thank you Jennifer for all the hard work that you were doing. John, I just please. I want to say on behalf of the board, one, the young people here and elsewhere and your parents and others, I mean, congratulations. And, and when I see you work, uh, you are the future of Michigan. I mean, you are the folks who are going to make this state and make your careers and invent new things. And so, so exciting to see uh, how you're thinking and what you're doing. So congratulations to you and to Linda and our staff, but Barbara and all of the STEM partnership efforts. It's fantastic to see you back in charge of an important piece of our state. And you know, I want to thank Eileen too for her active uh, nourishment and nurturing of the STEM effort here in Michigan. You know, when we look around at the horsepower we have in these disciplines, in our companies, in our universities, in our schools, you know, we can be the place that is the leader in all of these exciting uh, fields and work and, and new ideas and new products. And so you're whipping it into shape and fueling it is, is fantastic and a big important agenda for Michigan. So thank, thank you. you. I, would, I would just like to correct you. I'm, I'm not in charge. I am the executive <laughs> director and I'm working with a very vibrant board. But thank you so much for the, uh, for the compliments and the, and the kind words. Well, thank you, John. Well said. And, and Senator, I wanted to thank you for taking time to be here personally for the kids. We, we interact with you. Uh, and, you know, what, one thing we talk about when we come back from some of the hearings is, is you don't say a lot, but when you do, it's important. And we appreciate and we listen. So thanks for being here, Senator. And then maybe also I'll ask uh, Kyle Garant, uh, who has charge of our grants, and Carol, maybe I'm wondering if there's some creativity in our grant structure that we'd have some funds maybe to help support this next year we could at least take a look at that and see that if we wonderful. could um, make thank that you. happen but that would be great thank you so much do you mind if we ask if there's anyone else who'd like to share about their poster before we close I, or video or video I, would anybody else like to share just want to give you the opportunity since you drove all the way up here <laughs> 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 <No. laughs> okay well thank you for being here <laughs> thank you. okay thank you Mike thanks so much thanks again Okay, we're going to move right into, we're close to back on time, but we've gone from an hour behind to a half hour behind, so this is, we should be okay. Where are we going to lunch? And while we're transitioning. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm crying. Because this was, <laughs> to the point. We don't have our own. It's all yeah. 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 Yeah.
You know, it's like they're so grateful. Very good. Nice. Warm welcome. Very good. I'm not. Uh, I, we traveled through on a family vacation once. Thank you very much. And uh, got to Mackinac Island once. So that's the closest I've ever been. So. Yeah, sure. That's oh, fine. Like, right. Right. We can we can juggle seats. He's our closest. Yeah. Different parts with our kids, you know. Chair. Like a long distance waiting for Michael. He's first time. Yes. Michael. You want to go there? Oh yes. Just go there to mess yeah. up. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I walked the witch and not see any cigarette butts. Oh. Yeah, I'm good to see you, Mike. <laughs> it's been a while. I'm used to be. Thank you. Well, thanks again for your patience, Jeff, uh, sure. Amy, Amber, Sonia, Camille, and Mike. Appreciate your patience. I'm going to turn it, I think, right over to John. Um, but we really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today and your patience and, and the fact that we're a little bit behind. Well, and sure. I'm delighted we were able to get you here. Um, you know, colleague David Hecker uh, was uh, eager to have uh, he and Jeffrey co chairs of the Indian Schools this year. Uh, I'm the executive director. The executive director. Yeah. Um, I apologize. David was um, eager to have us uh, give you an opportunity to educate ourselves and everybody about the work that you're doing. And I know Wonderful. I've loosely followed it, but I uh, sure. need some education myself about the great organization and the work you're doing in schools and also looking for things that we can um, do to be supportive and helpful in that effort. So thank you. Well, wonderful. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say good morning. I guess now good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Board President, distinguished members of the Board of Education and Superintendent Flanagan. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown, and I have the honor of being the State Director of Communities and Schools of Michigan. Um, our Board President, David Hecker, wasn't able to join us today, and he wanted to uh, have me be sure and send his regrets. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide information today about the good work that's being done by communities and schools across the state. Um, to better explain our work from a national perspective, we'd like to start by sharing a, a video with you of our work. So we'll start, start with a little movie, which is always fun for boards, I find. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> <In Maryland? laughs> I was I was clicking it. It just doesn't want to go. Not clicking Maybe it's hard enough. To my touch. That's it. <laughs> when I was in school, I did struggle with my grades. I didn't really like school because I was. Struggling. I didn't feel confident about myself at all. I felt like I just reached my breaking point. Like, I didn't care no more. Forget school, forget life. I started working when I was on a young age. It was crap milling. My life wasn't focused on school. Public education is designed to provide all young people at a shot with the American dream. Each year, we see about 1.2 million young people who never graduate and never will, which means they are pipelined to be second-class citizens. For many of the kids that I serve, the idea of what's normal is very different. What's normal for them is the power going out, moving every six months, calling your mom while she's at work and trying to make sure you're not getting her fired. These children didn't choose to be disadvantaged. They didn't choose to be poor. They didn't choose to not have mentorship. And they didn't choose to not have the basic necessities at home. Our mission is to go to the poorest performing schools and the poorest kids in America. So it is going to the heart of the dropout problem and attending to the non-academic barriers so that we could actually free up the young people to be able to learn. In community are extraordinary resources. They're just disconnected from the very young people that need them. When you link those great resources with a kid that's really in need, magic happens. And you see kids just flourish, even in the most dire circumstances, when there's a caring adult providing them the kinds of resources they need to be able to succeed academically.
The communities and school site coordinators are the hub of activity in the school. They connect children with whatever they need. My job is to empower them, bring the community and the resources that are around to support them. They may have what it takes, but they don't know what steps they need to take in order to get there. If I not have met Mr. Weeks, I would probably not be in high school. He was the one who provided me for anything I needed help with in school or at home. He gave me hope. He gave me a lot of help. Put me back on track. That's what our schools need to be doing, is allowing our teachers to teach so that our staff, who are dedicated, giving, generous social workers and counselors, can get to the root of what's going on with that child and fix it. Communities and Schools has a, a unique and critical role in helping to improve education in America. For every dollar invested in Communities and Schools, we return to the community $11.60. There is actually a good economic argument to do the right and just thing. Communities and schools knows that the heart of every child wants to succeed. We unlock that voice within the child that says, I can be something bigger and I can be something better because someone believes in me. You did it. Good job. I'm getting these kids ready to be successful in life. Our mission is to surround these students with a community of support. I'm here for you and you can do it. You can still succeed. I will help you make it through school. Well, right now I see a very bright future, and I know I, that when I fall, I have somebody to catch me. I'm really excited about my future, that I can read and I can do math. I think I could be anything I want to be if I just put my mind to it. I'm almost out of high school, figure I'd go to college, start my life. My future's very bright, the grass is green on the other side. For these kids to understand how learning is such an important gift, the struggles that they go through every day and yet they can still come to school and they can have a smile on their face. But I know I made a difference. Wonderful. Now, thanks for uh, allowing us to show you a little bit of uh, video from a national perspective. Um, at the core of our mission is uh, helping young people who are struggling in school. The young person could be facing challenges in any school. However, we find there are many more struggling students in schools where poverty is high. Um, as a result, communities and schools programs are almost always in schools where the vast majority of students live in poverty. When we find that struggling student, it's our mission to surround them with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. The struggles students face are walls that separate them from academic success. They can be social, emotional, or physical. Sometimes the wall can be cleared quickly, and sometimes the wall is so massive, uh, it appears to be too tall to ever clear. Um, regardless, if someone is not there to help, this wall of problems will keep the student from succeeding in school. And when that happens, it is tremendously expensive for you and me in terms of economic and social expense we will face because this young person is not ready to contribute meaningfully to our workforce and economy. For the young person, it will be tragic because they will most likely never break the chains of poverty. Communities and Schools is a network of independent nonprofit organizations. When we are invited to work in a school, we hire a site coordinator who works every day to help students. The trained professional site coordinator serves as a bridge between the needs of the students and all the resources that exist in the community. The site coordinator serves as a single point of contact for a student, linking students to integrated services, while also playing the role of adult role model, case manager, mentor, and friend. Those services may include mentoring, tutoring, health care, uh, after school programs, family counseling, vocational learning, and much more. They do whatever it takes to help the student succeed. They work with school administrators and teachers to identify students who need help with their academic performance, their school behavior, their attendance, and other needs. The site coordinator then secures parental consent and involvement 
and works with the student to develop a plan of action to produce tangible results. Does whatever it takes during the school year to produce positive results and evaluates the student's success when the school year ends. In addition, the site coordinator works to the school's leadership to identify school-wide issues and then rolls out programs, services, and events throughout the school year to address those whole school needs. The CIS model provides great flexibility to respond to individual school and community needs and characteristics and values. Communities and schools has met the required threshold of research to be referred to as an evidence-based practice. CS is a research and data-driven model which brings together the rigor of ongoing evaluation and the best professional practices available to deliver positive results. Both a five-year uh, third-party evaluation and a return on investment study have found that CIS is both effective and produces results that provide significant economic benefit to the community. CIS is the only national comprehensive dropout prevention program which both decreases dropouts and increases graduation rates while positively impacting academic achievement. CIS affiliates meet a stringent set of total quality standards to achieve accreditations within the system, which indicates they are operating at the highest level of best practice as a nonprofit. So in 2012-13, CIS uh, uh, had five local affiliates in Michigan located in Metro Detroit, Kalamazoo, Lenaway, Mancelona, and Tecumseh. And those affiliates serve students in Antrim, Kalamazoo, Kalkaska, Lenaway, Macomb, Oakland, Washtenaw, and Wayne counties, uh, covering 17 districts at 51 school sites. Uh, and the results uh, of the work of our great affiliates was significant. Uh, we worked with over 20,000 students in 2012-13 case managed 2,332 students. Uh, we assisted 98.6% of those students to stay in school who were at risk for dropping out. 81% of those students were promoted to the next grade. And 99% of the students that we worked with graduated from school on time. Uh, the average graduate, graduation rate for the students in the same schools that we worked in was 76%. Uh, we had 78% of those students improve their behavior, 73% increase their academic achievement, and 76 improved their attendance. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the person who had the longest drive coming here today <laughs> is uh, Amy Burke, our Executive Director from Communities and Schools of Mancelona. Hi, it's great to be here today. My name is Amy Burke and I'm the Executive Director of Communities and Schools of Mancelona. Our, our affiliate is located in a small rural area in northern Michigan. However, our community faces high poverty, low education attainment, and we, st we still struggle from the economic recession. With a total student population of about two, 989 students, over 76% of them are enrolled in the free and reduced lunch program. The students at the Mansellon Public School District, 28% are from families that fall below the poverty line. The current number of homeless students is 79. During the past five years, factories supporting the automotive industry that employed many of our community members closed, and several of our downtown businesses sit empty, leaving limited employment opportunities. This has resulted in frequent family mobility movement and with a student mobility rate of 12.7%. As a K-8 Title I school district, students fall below the state proficiency proficiency levels in math and reading and are frequently outperformed by nearly all of the other districts in our regional intermediate school district. According to our school district's education dashboard, 24.1% of students in grades 3 through 8 are proficient in reading and math compared to 35.6% in the regional intermediate school district. And only 5.5% of students were proficient in the Michigan merit exam compared to 17.4% statewide. In 2001, communities and schools began providing services to students and families in the Mancelona area. At that time, we relied upon AmeriCorps VISTA for program support and focused on school-wide initiatives. Although we were successful in our early years, it wasn't until 2009 that we implemented the CIS model with fidelity with a full-time site coordinator at each of our three school buildings. With a caring adult in each of the school buildings, our affiliate was able to scale up our efforts and better focus on the whole child addressing unmet physical, psychological, and social needs that interrupt learning. Located in the school building, the site coordinator builds relationships with the students and does whatever it takes to help them succeed. 
as Mancelona is a rural setting with the closest urban light hub over 40 miles away, our community lacks adequate community resources to support all of our children's unmet needs. Therefore, CIS of Mancelona provides many of the services ourselves. Specific services may encompass tutoring, mentoring, a backpack with school supplies, a safe place to go after school, or fulfilling their quest for post-secondary education. We have built a solid foundation with our school partner and are looked upon to assist in addressing needs and gaps within the district and making our schools places of learning and achievement. Since CIS and Mancelona began providing services, the graduation rate has increased from 60.8% in 2003 to 91% in 2013. We often ask ourselves, why are we so successful? But our answer is simple. Our success is solely due to relationships with our school district, community partners, and most of all, with our students and families that we serve. And now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Amber Carr Kennedy, who is a Communities and Schools of Mancelona alumni. Hi. <laughs> and um, so my name is Amber Carr Kennedy, and I would like to thank the Michigan State Board of Education for the opportunity to speak about my experiences with Communities and Schools of Mancelona. I am the youngest of five children in a blended family. Um, my father dropped out of school when he was 16, and my mother completed high school but never went to college. My father has worked for Northern A1 American Waste in Kalkaska my entire life. And my mother is a sales associate at Walmart. They are hardworking people who did the best they could for their children. My father was often out of town for work and my mother worked nights. She also suffered from bipolar disorder, which went undiagnosed until after I reached adulthood. In spite of their work ethic, our family never had much. My parents wanted more for us, but really didn't have an understanding of how we could achieve that. My father's frequent absence for work and my mother's mental instability made growing up challenging. By the time I had reached high school, three of my older siblings had dropped out of school. One of my sisters became pregnant her senior year of high school, and she had my nephew a few days after her graduation. When I was a sophomore, my only goal was to graduate and move out of my town. <laughs> I had no college hopes, and I had no concern for the future. I missed a lot of school because it was very easy to skip. I was not overly concerned with turning in my assignments or completing required work, even though I was bright enough to do well. It was this time in my life that I became involved with communities and schools of Mancelona. Then, there were no site coordinators, but AmeriCorps VISTA members that would run programming. I became involved with a drama club that was supported by CIS and ran by a VISTA member named Carol Weeks. I'll never forget her. Um, <laughs> I loved that drama club. To be involved, I had to get my grades up and come to school more often which I did. I helped to design the set, choose costumes, and I also got a small part in the play. It was the first time I had ever felt a sense of accomplishment. The next school year, I was asked to help with the play again, and Carol Weeks asked me to help her pick that year's play. I remember how proud I felt that my opinion mattered so much. That year, our drama club was phenomenal. Communities and Schools of Mancelona also facilitated a leadership conference Teachers recommended national leaders from the student body to participate in the conference, and I was one of the students selected. Before that, I never felt like a leader, and I certainly didn't feel that anyone found import me important enough to recommend me. And now I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the conference, we talked about grasses. Thank you. <laughs> We talked about college and future careers. I decided then that I wanted to go to college and that I would become someone who made a difference. It was hard to figuring out what to do with college because no one in my family knew what, how the process worked. At the time, I had to figure out how to apply for college and financial aid virtually on my own and considered giving up several times but persevered because I was a leader and leaders don't quit. I, grad I graduated from Mancelona High School in 2006, almost by the skin of my teeth, um, and I have not had a traditional education since. I am the first person in my family to go to college. I went to college part-time and switched majors on several occasions. Being in college was exciting, and the possibilities were endless, and there was a lot of trial and error. This was a whole new culture that I could not wait to experience every aspect of it. I eventually graduated with my associate's degree in 2010, Later this year, I will be graduating with my bachelor's degree in social work from Ferris State University. <laughs> <laughs> Learning.
last year I had an amazing opportunity Whew. to work for Communities and Schools in Mancelona as an AmeriCorps volunteer. It was amazing to see how much the agency has grown since I was in school. They were now able to offer college access services, such as FAFSA help, college application help, and college site visits. They have an amazing mentoring program that helps to place a child with a caring adult from the community. After I completed my AmeriCorps year service, I was hired by Communities and Schools in Mancelona as a program assistant to help facilitate after-school programs to enrich our students' lives. When I was a student at Mancelona Schools, Communities and Schools came in and inspired me to be better than I thought I could be. As an adult and a professional, I have the amazing opportunity to not only work for the agency I believe in and know works, but to give back to a community that has given me so much. Thank you. <laughs> Now I'd like to introduce Sonia Allen, the CEO of Communities and Schools of Metropolitan Detroit. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to share our story. Since 1995, Communities and Schools has developed the local and national partnerships to provide high-quality educational and intervention services that transform student lives. CIS of Metropolitan Detroit's 32 full and part-time staff are serving more than 10,000 students and their families and 20 schools. Our geographical service area includes Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and Washtenaw counties. Our school-based services range from whole school programs, which would include the entire student body, to targeted services, which often include small groups, and intensive services, which mostly include individual case-managed students. Investing in CIS yields high dividends for students. During the 2012-2013 academic year, 20 public schools in Metro Detroit invested more than $2 million with CIS to implement our national evidence-based model. CIS then leveraged the mostly Title I investments into a service value totaling more than $7 million. Impact matters. All case management services are tracked through our CIS National Data Management System, and each student's individual service plan outlined an approach for their improvement in academics, behavior, and or attendance. And Jeff showed some, shared some of the statistics, but we're very, very proud that 99% of our eligible seniors graduated, and we're going to have 100% of our students graduating. CIS of Metro Detroit uh, outcomes indicate that the CIS model is making a positive difference in the lives of students. Additionally, at CIS, we believe that programs don't change kids. Rather, it's the positive relationships in their lives that really make the difference. Today, an amazing young lady has joined me to share her CIS story with you. Her name is Camille Tynes. Camille attended Southeastern High School where she, rec where she received integrated support services from our communities and school site coordinator, Teresa Lewis. Although Camille was a very active student in robotics and the choir, she grappled with many personal challenges that could have pro compromised her ability to prosper. However, Camille relied on her self-motivation and her community of support to continue with her educational goals. She graduated from Southeastern in 2008 with honors, and is currently a college student who anticipates graduating from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor later this year. Camille credits her success in high school and her drive to earn a college degree to the relationships that she's built with her CIS site coordinator and other caring adults in her life. I invite you to experience CIS through the lens of Camille's testimony and it's my pleasure to present to you Ms. Camille Tynes. Thank you. Again, my name is Camille Tynes. I am an alumni of the CIS chapter in Detroit, specifically from Southeastern High School. Um, initially, I came to Southeastern High School in 2004, and I did all four of my high school years at Southeastern. And unbeknownst to most people, I came in with a different situation. I came into the school coming into the foster care system. So prior to, in middle school, my father was very abusive. And so finally, my mother, um, 
had the strength to take me and my siblings and we had to run and hide from him living in domestic violence shelters and we did that for quite some time. But a point came where I ended up getting put in the foster care system and separated from my five brothers and sisters. And that was the most challenging and difficult time for me. I wanted to give up. I didn't know how to push forward and I didn't know who I could connect with. But while I was at Southeastern, um, my freshman year, I faced different challenges and obstacles. But it was my sophomore year, I met Ms. Teresa Lewis, who was a site coordinator for CIS Southeastern High School. And there, I couldn't help but be connected to her because of her personality, her warmth, and her desire to help you. Whether that was through telling you the truth and make you feel a little uncomfortable or through providing you with many services that you needed. Um, I know that we do have a limited time, but I must tell you of the services that she assisted me with. I remember there was a time where I came to her and um, we were just talking about what was going on in my life. And I let her know I lost my glasses. And I was struggling in my classes, not because I didn't have the intellectual ability, but because I couldn't see while I was reading. And as soon as she found out, she didn't say, why did you lose your glasses? Where are your glasses? She didn't say anything of that sort to me. She said, okay. And she went through the resources that she had, and she ended up finding um, a certificate for me to go see an eye doctor free of charge. And I got my pair of glasses. And I know that really helped me get back on track academically, but then also emotionally. Some of my struggles has not really been with academics per se, but it's been with emotional issues. And my site coordinator really helped me to push through a lot of my obstacles and struggles. By living on the east side of Detroit, in an area that's just filled with poverty and low hopes, I had a desire at one time to go to Harvard. No one ever told me that I could really go to college and do what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, my mother would encourage me at times, but no one in my school, whether it was my peers or even some of my <coughs> teachers, really believed that a student from Southeastern could make it onto a collegiate level that, that that amazing, we'll just say that for lack of better words. But when I told her I wanted to go to Harvard, she said, okay. And she went in her, <laughs> her Rolodex of cards and she got me the information of a lady who went to Harvard and was just a renowned woman. And that amazed me. It amazed me to have someone that believed in me, that didn't know me that well, but believed I had the potential. So as I matriculated through the rest of my four years at Southeastern, uh, Ms. Lewis brought many services to myself, to my peers, and also to the school in general, bringing renowned speakers from all across the world to motivate us, to really connect with us. And there was one opportunity that really has kind of trajected the rest of my life right now and the academic career that I have as well as my professional career. There was an opportunity where Ms. Lewis had received an invitation to get a tour of Channel 7 and to have a lunch with uh, Chuck Stokes. And she asked me if I would go with her. And I went with her and I got the tour and while we were there, she was really helping to groom me as a young person with a bright future. She didn't just look at me oh, as, oh, I'm some charity class. She said, no, you're someone that you're gonna be amazing. You're gonna do great things with your life. And as I was there, she was teaching me how to network. <laughs> She's like, where's your business cards? How do you do this? It felt a little uncomfortable because it's like, oh man, you're correcting me in front of people. Mm -hmm. But what she was really doing <laughs> was teaching me how to network and how to be professional in different settings. And I know I still use that to this day. Her investments within me has shown me I can do whatever I desire to do. And so I continue to push forward in all that I do with my work now, working with youth to help them really advocate for themselves and receive resources. So I know for personally, I'm here today because I love what CIS has done. I had class and I have to work. But when they asked me to come and speak about the CIS program, I was like, man, I have to. Ms. Lewis has been amazing. So I called my boss. I was like, hey, can we switch around my schedule? <laughs> I talked to my professor and said, can I miss your class? I have to go and tell my experience of this program to really help other youth that are in the school system that need a CIS or need more support from CIS. So I'm just here because I just wanted to tell that part of my story. And um, I desired to go to college, and she helped me go to U of M. And she actually helped me get a fee waiver um, to go to my university. I wasn't going to go to U of M because I didn't think I would have the money. I almost turned down my opportunity to go to Michigan because I thought I was poor and broke from Detroit. And she was like, no, there's scholarship money. We're going to find something for you. And Ms. Lewis directly assisted me with getting the Paul Roberson scholarship as well as getting the Chrysler scholarship. So I really dedicate so much of what I have to her. And I really admire her. I admire her strength. I admire her tenacity. And I admire her willingness to pull her, her resources together to leverage so many 
supportive services, not just for my school and for me individually, but for our, my community at large. So I thank you for giving me this time to tell my story and experiences with CIS and my site coordinator, Ms. Teresa Lewis. Okay, and, and, uh, and then last but not least, uh, from the perspective of a school superintendent who works very closely with communities and schools, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Rice, superintendent of Kalamazoo Public Schools. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to address the board and state superintendent on the important subject of communities and schools. Kalamazoo Public Schools has approximately 13,000 students, pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. 70% of whom are free or reduced price lunch eligible. Uh, we're the largest district uh, in southwestern Michigan, the second largest on the western side of the state. We've grown by 2,300 students since the Kalamazoo Promise was uh, announced eight years ago. Uh, and we've had the, uh, the benefit in the last five years of driving higher reading and math achievement, higher uh, advanced placement participation. We've doubled our advanced placement participation in five years we've raised our graduation rates as well. Well, we've also had some notable visitors in the, uh, in the district. Uh, board members Strauss and Vecto came to congratulate the Greenwood Elementary community on a beating the odds designation last year. Uh, Superintendent Flanagan visited the district in 2010, in which he was very complimentary. Several months after the vice president's visit, and uh, President Obama spoke at the Kalamazoo Central High School graduation when the school district and community uh, were honored in the first race to the top commencement challenge. In spite of the success that we've had, though, and to paraphrase uh, Robert Frost, we have miles to go before we sleep. Uh, we are uh, a tremendously challenged community in many different ways. Not only 70 percent free or reduced price lunch eligible, a little bit less than Mancelone, I noted, um, <laughs> but uh, nine of our elementary schools are 80 percent or more free or reduced price lunch eligible. Six of them are 89 percent or more free or reduced price lunch eligible. The concentrations of poverty are particularly challenging. It is more difficult to be in poverty in concentrations of poverty than it is to be a singleton in an otherwise middle class environment. There's 50 years of research to show this as uh, well. Well, Kalamazoo has one of the highest child poverty rates in the state. CIS is critical to help us meet our children's needs. CIS helps us coordinate the following. Academic support from volunteers, community agencies, and businesses. The distribution of food packs to needy students on Friday afternoons. Vision screenings. Dental checkups in a mobile dental van. Community mental health outreach after school programming. And summer school programming. <clears throat> Integral to the success of communities and schools model is a part-time site coordinator at each participating school. Site coordinators are responsible for helping to meet the myriad needs that children have and that poor children, unlike their middle-class peers, do not have addressed at home. These include poor vision, problems with teeth, hunger, and mental health issues, which are addressed by us as middle-class parents as a matter of course in the lives of our middle-class uh, children, as well as some academic concerns as well. While no organization can fully meet the non-academic needs of students, CIS helps enormously to remove certain impediments or barriers to success with which many of our students struggle. In recognition of this fact, in the last five years, while KPS has cut more than $12 million from its budget, we've managed to expand our work with communities and schools from 9 to 19 of our district's schools, of our district's 25 schools. Indeed, three weeks ago, we were named one of four communities of excellence nationally in the CIS network by the National Communities of Schools at its National Town Hall meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. As the State Board looks at strategic investments in children, those that will help make Michigan a leader in student achievement, graduation rate, college going, and college completion, Kalamazoo uh, communities and schools needs to be considered among the top of the list. And I appreciate the opportunity to address the board now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike. You. Now, I know we want to respect your amount of time, but we certainly would like to answer any questions. We'd like to do that, Jeff. Thanks. And first, uh, Amber and Camille, just 
great inspiration for us. This, these are stories that keep us going and, and keep us on focus. So thanks for sharing those and the rest of the team and, and board members that have comments or questions for our folks. Kathleen, please. Well, I'm delighted to have this presentation, and I'm pleased to say that I was on the board of the Communities and Schools at Metro Detroit for enough years that I was term limited a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the state board. <laughs> so, Thank you. I'm so glad to see Sonia here, and, and you and Andrew were just so impressive and so terrific. And we're so proud of you, and so proud of communities and schools, and Michael, too. But you mentioned Michelle and me before President Obama. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were too. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, I, I agree with what, what Michael said, that if we have a chance to, to invest you know, with grants and whatever, and I know we do, uh, CIS is, is the, really the prime place to, to put the investment, to put the grants. So um, it's good that, that we got some publicity on it. I, I left the board was just after you started as a state coordinator, so uh, I'm glad to see the things are really perking along pretty well. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Thank, but thank you and two directors at, at UGIF. It's, it's very impressive and, and helpful. <laughs> thank you, Kath. I think Gary was next, and then John, and then Dan. Well, again, thank you for this presentation, and thank you both for sharing your experiences from the student perspective. From, a, from my, wearing my teacher hat, I hear a lot of the things that you're doing address needs and, and things of students outside of school, but some of these things have a, a bit of an overlap, and so you mentioned, for example, helping students to get financial aid to be able to achieve the potential that they have with post-secondary education. What are some things that you might be able to suggest that we can help to bring to more teachers in schools where this program is not currently in existence? Because I wonder how we can support places where, where your program has not yet reached to help them have some of the same successes that your program is, help, is having um, in things like students achieving uh, financial aid or in those relationship pieces that you both mentioned are, <coughs> were so important. Well, I guess I'll try to field that. I guess, uh, first of all, you know, in a perfect world, we would have CIS in all the schools in Michigan. So I, you know, I'd start there. But um, given the fact that that's a challenge right now and our expansion is, is moving along but slowly, um, I would say that uh, the key piece of this and probably the most challenging part is to deliver the service um, through somebody who is a caring adult. Uh, you know, uh, it's one thing to have the service or have a program. Uh, but as our founder and as Sonia uh, recognized, you know, it's not programs that change people, it's people who change people. So I think that that relationship is a key. Certainly we have an, a numerous programs available in the state. Um, you know, the Michigan College Access Network is certainly one that comes to mind and we've, we've worked very closely with them. Amy has been a coordinator for the local College Access Network in, uh, in that uh, area of Mancelona before. So, I mean, that's just another partner organization we work with. You know, certainly working with school counselors and social workers is certainly part of our work. Um, and encouraging and supporting, you know, their ability to be able to, to address things uniquely with students is very important. Thank you. John? Can I add on to that? Oh, please. Um, I would suggest if you don't have the capacity at the moment to have a CIS site coordinator, which would be very important is getting someone from the in the community that's already established that has relationships and has a connection whether with the school or with the youth to come in and possibly volunteer their time and either working with CIS to bring some training on how to leverage the services and resources that you have to assist it because I know there are so many phenomenal teachers who bend over backwards whether it's picking up students from school and taking them off spending their own personal money but as a student I also can see the stress that it puts on the instructor as well as the services that are become lacking so allowing the teacher and a counselor to play their role will be great so if you could bring in a volunteer if you're tight with your money bring in a volunteer get them the training through CIS and teach them how to leverage the resources and connect with other community partners and businesses to come around with whether um, helping summer employment that was something also to my CIS, CIS site coordinator helped with I did a gear program I got a, a job at 
a Southeastern Village Resource Center. And so that was something that she connected for a lot of the students. So using those community relationships mm -hmm. that you already have to get someone in to volunteer until you have the capacity to actually get someone in like a CSI coordinator. That's something that I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. John was, and then Dan. Well, thank you all for sharing your, your work in such a powerful way. Where does the money come from now, and has there been historically, or, or where's the overlap between policies, programs, projects, funding sources sure. from state or other efforts? Well, we, we uh, our affiliate network in Michigan uses a variety of funding streams. And I would say, you know, certainly the 21st century after school dollars have been very helpful in a couple of our program, notably Kalamazoo and Mancelona. Uh, those dollars have not been available uh, in some of our other locations. Um, we uh, operate in a, in a world where we do uh, qualify, our work qualifies for Title I dollars, so that's a possibility. The new uh, definition of uh, school improvement dollars, uh, the whole school approach, actually has uh, language in that bill that was just passed in a recent budget uh, in Washington that uh, fits very well with the work that CIS does, so there's some potential qualifications there. Uh, we've had long-term uh, relationships with business. We have a significant business uh, investment from a number of multinational and large corporations, uh, both in Michigan and across the country, and, and private donors. Um, but frankly, you know, our biggest challenge is resources, and I'm sure that comes as no surprise to anybody here. If, if we're able to put uh, site coordinators in more buildings, we're going to have a higher graduation rate in the state of Michigan, and we're going to end up with kids that have um, more ability to reach their potential, and that's, that's the key. Um, so, you know, we're certainly looking for that. We have not had state investment in CIS uh, recently. There was a one-time investment about four years ago. Um, and uh, we're certainly uh, open to that and would like to consider it. Around the country, there is significant investment by states in communities and schools, 15 million in education uh, in Texas and another five in TANF dollars in Texas, six million dollars in North Carolina, uh, three million dollars in Georgia, two or three million dollars in Florida. Um, and, and you know, there's a direct relationship between the investment and the kids served. So our costs run somewhere between 200 and 215 or 20 dollars per student um, uh, to serve. So it's a, a fairly good return on investment for the amount of dollars invested. Thank you. Yeah. And Amber, you may want to talk to that guy right next to you there because he could—he has the governor's ear. He could. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> not to put him on the spot. This here, is not my first exposure. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Ruff and I've had conversations. <laughs> okay, Dan, please. Um, but let me add my thanks uh, for coming and presenting and really presenting such a powerful testimony about uh, um, the organization and the, uh, the impact that it has on young people uh, and frankly the whole community um, that it serves. Um, and congratulations, I, so to John's point about uh, where the money comes from, I, I, um, I have some previous experience with CIS. I mean, mm -hmm. just offer that background. And knew Charlie Anderson, who was a, a bit of a mentor uh, for me when 15 years ago, <laughs> when uh, a friend and I were starting our own organization um, to try and do some good work uh, on behalf of kids in Detroit. Uh, and congratulations to you on taking the reins uh, at, in, in, um, uh, of the Detroit chapter and the, and the good work you've done. I know a little bit about the challenges that you faced uh, in walking in, and it's it's great that, that uh, the organization was able to get somebody of uh, your stature and caliber to, to run it and maintain it and, and help put it back on a really solid financial footing. Um, so congratulations to you. Um, uh, so to that point, just to the leverage point, really one of the things that's always struck me about CIS uh, is the fact that you, so two things, one is that you do require an investment from the school, so the school has skin in the game, it wouldn't, so if, it, if you're not producing results, the school can disinvest and off you go, right? Uh, and that, the fact that schools are opting in, mm -hmm. Right, um, and putting money on the table because they get that it's a worthwhile investment speaks volumes to the level of worthwhileness that you bring. Um, one, and then two, the the amount of leverage that you bring to that. So I, I don't know what the Kalamazoo chapter overall brings, but 
think when I spent time with Charlie, it was something like, and I think it was in the video, but I maybe missed it, seven to one or something, something ridiculous. Yep. Like for every dollar put in, there's a ridiculous amount of money yeah. uh, and other resources that you're able to provide uh, to those students in school community. It's just, I think it's a fantastic model. My one quick, so congratulations on all of that, all Thank of you. that, to all of you. Uh, my one quick question is, uh, my recollection, um, and this is very dated, uh, this is probably six, seven, eight years ago, um, was that at the time, the Detroit chapter anyway, and that's, that's my only kind of set of uh, detailed enough experience here to know, was working, I think, um, so it was with multiple districts in the Detroit area. They were all traditional districts. Mm -hmm. It was Detroit and Inkster and Warren. I don't remember what they were, but they were traditional districts. Um, they weren't working with charters at all. That, the EAA didn't even exist at the time. I'm just wondering, like, is the business model such that you're able to work with schools of other governance types too? Or is that, like, we're just given kind of what's happened in terms of state law sure. and so on and so forth, I'm well, just curious Yeah, about the general the answer is yeah. yes. I mean, we do, uh, we, you know, we don't necessarily have a dog in the fight. I right. mean, frankly, right. what we want to do is go where the kids have the biggest need. Right. And, and you know, uh, the <coughs> delivery system of the curriculum and the way the system is set up is going to vary from community to community. Uh, certainly, uh, Sonia's had some experience uh, in Metro Detroit of working with a number of different school systems. Uh, we're in two EAAs currently, is that right? Working with the EAA, uh, working with uh, also Ypsilanti, and uh, we've also done some work with Pontiac. So we are, we're going where the need is and where we can, uh, we can serve kids and families. And I would just add to that too that, you know, some of the reasons we're in those buildings is because they were prior to being perhaps EAAs or other kinds of systems, they were DPS schools. When, when that transition happened, those principals stepped up and advocated and said, you know, yes. we can, you can change that system, but I want my CIS folks. I need to have them come with me. Again, I think it speaks to the point you'd made before, which is, you know, there is an investment at that level. Well, congratulations. It's just uh, it's a stellar, stellar organization. It does really good work. So. Thank you very much. Great to have Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeff and the whole team, very inspirational and really uh, helps us understand better. So thanks for taking the time. Sorry. Are we wrapping up? I had to. <laughs> I was jump. laying with my. Um, oh, I had a question. Sure. Um, Please. And it does. It, it, it does sound like a wonderful uh, model. And so. But I was curious how schools could uh, locally get you into what finances they have at their discretion to use to bring you in. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, and I was also, my, another question I have is, um, do you tend to work with high schools or middle schools as well? Okay. So we work in the K-12 space. Okay. The so, whole thing. So we're going we're gonna to be in a variety of different grade levels and building configurations. <coughs> and, and one of the advantages of our system is we're able to pass kids from building to building uh, and from grade level to grade level so that we don't lose all that data and we're able to help that child all the way through the system if that's what's necessary. Um, so. This is the crux of the issue. Is how do you how do you launch uh, an affiliate in a community that doesn't currently have one? And so, what we do is we typically will come into a community if it, if we ascertain that there's a significant need. And of course, there are a variety of communities throughout the state who have high need uh, in terms of graduation rates and poverty rates and academic performance. So we have a big list. Yeah. Um, and typically, if we go into that community, we see uh, really two, two key ingredients. One is that we're looking for a business champion. Somebody from the business community will be a champion in that community for CIS who can rally uh, fellow business investment and community leaders around the issues that we're trying to resolve. And the second piece is obviously that there needs to be a, some type of resources available in the community. That can be from the school itself, Title I dollars, at-risk dollars, uh, SIG funding? Is uh, SIG grant money? State funding would be wonderful. Or SIG, um, the, um, the school improvement grants. Right, school and group improvement grants. You can grants. use those? Yep. There's, we can be a vendor in okay. that okay. process. Okay. So, uh, so that's a possibility if the school system chooses to use those resources in that way. You know, they have so many challenges facing them uh, that sometimes they need to figure out other ways to keep even some staff that they otherwise would lose. I mean, just to lay it out on the table, that's what happens, right? So those are challenges. What we're trying to do at the state level in my office is to try to leverage statewide support for this work. 
um, from foundations, from business investment, obviously from the state is, is certainly a goal of ours in the long run because the sustainability of the work is critical. Um, we don't like to go into a building or a community and be there for, for two or three years and then disappear. It's a disservice to the district. It's a disservice to the kids. It's not the way we operate. It's a relationship-based business. And what we want to do is have significant impact on a culture change in the community. And the way to do that is to be there for a long time. And so that's what we're looking to do. So yes, we're, we're looking for that. And certainly any guidance or advice that, that we can get from the State Board would be wonderful. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for your leadership on this. Thanks for you all taking the time today and the patience with, uh, with us. And maybe we can just, since there's one last item before the lunch, if we could just go to item D, and is there any discussion regarding the criteria for grant programs? Superb jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Go blue. Go blue. <laughs> <laughs> Give you a second to look at that. I don't want to. Actually, I do want to jam it through, but I won't. <laughs> we we don't want to give anyone the right impression. <laughs> Clever. So any any discussion on the criteria for grant programs that we'll take up this afternoon and consent. Okay, well, good. Then I think we'll recess for lunch. And, John, any suggestion on timing? What would you? Close to 135. Yeah, that's a good idea. So 1.30-ish? Yeah. We'll look for 1.30-ish. Okay. Thanks all in public. Thanks for being here. Sorry we're running a little late. We'll be back here at 1.30, so feel free to. There's a cafeteria down on the UP level if you're interested. Bring this an iPad off. We'll go to the elevator.